Now, just a really brief overview of today's program. Um, you may not be able to read it terribly well on that screen, but it is in the welcome pack, so you can have a look at it in more detail there. Um, so we've got a series of presentations, lightning talks, discussion sessions and interactive activities planned for today. Um, at the end of today's activities, the ARDC will be providing um, drinks and some nibblies, so please stay around for a chat and some networking then. And for those online, I wish you were all here, um, but unfortunately you're not. Uh, so uh, yeah, maybe network with your families at home or something like that. Um, please feel free to get up and stretch and walk around during the day because it is a long day to be just sitting. And, um, and also I will throw quickly to Slava for a quick plug for Resbaz in Melbourne this year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. My name is Slava Kitaev. I'm from Monashi Research. Uh, and just um, book, book a date, <laughs> advertisement, uh, end of November, we are organizing a uh, Victorian Research Bazaar event. So we haven't had uh, one for a while in Melbourne. So please get excited. <laughs> it is exciting, I have to say, very. So you'll all have to come along to that. Um, so the most important message that I would like to finish on today, uh, well this morning as part of the logistics section, um, is to impart to everyone to join in, actively participate, contribute and enjoy. So now, I think I'll have to throw to you, Keith, because I'm not sure that Alex is here yet. Good morning, all. Welcome. Wonderful to have you all here. Uh, and in, in such a wonderful spot on a sunny Melbourne day, which is a bit of an e exception or a, a bit variable anyway. So um, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Keith Russell. I am Director Outreach at the Australian Research Data Commons. In my role, I'm responsible for um, the skilled workforce team, which uh, have pulled all this together and pulled off to this amazing event. So uh, uh, very grateful for the work they're doing but also the engagements team and the, the comms team. So I thought I'd provide you with a little bit of perspective and a little bit of background about what are we here for, why are we here, what is our purpose. So, um, the aim for this skills summit, we were thinking about this a bit, puzzling a little bit about what are we really trying to achieve, what is the aim here? And um, I've got some lovely notes here. Um, bringing together the key stakeholders to explore the shared challenge of building a digitally skilled and enabled research workforce, and we're not finished yet, capable of unlocking the full potential of Australia's digital research infrastructure. So the key stakeholders, I guess, must be you. So that's digital research infrastructure providers, maybe some of you identify with that, or researchers, maybe, a few in the room, Definitely skills trainers. I'm sure I've seen a few of those here. And influencers, policy makers, those that are thinking about this challenge. So as we were looking at the program and thinking about it, it's both the upskilling of the researchers themselves, but it's also thinking about that digital research infrastructure workforce that supports those researchers. Uh, we spent a bit of time on that yesterday afternoon. I'll come back to that. So we were thinking about this and thinking about an angle that we could use to uh, address those researchers and think about the researchers that we're targeting. And we've decided to go along the lines of the thematic research data commons. That's an approach that ARDC is taking. I'll talk a little bit about more about it in a moment. And uh, so what we're gonna be hearing today is a number of projects that we're building through the thematic research data commons. So they are in the space of health and medical, that's the people, uh, RDC, in the space of earth and environmental, and in the space of Hass and Indigenous research. So we often hear the 
the truism, I'm not sure it is a truism, um, about build it and they will come. Uh, I don't think it's true. I don't think it's that straightforward and it's that simple. Just building stuff is not going to be sufficient. So, of course, the users of that research infrastructure, those researchers actually need to know this infrastructure exists, the value of that infrastructure, and see the evidence of the impact that it enables. So I think that's one of the things we're going to be looking at today as we're looking at those pieces of infrastructure that are being built, that digital research infrastructure, and how we can actually make sure researchers are aware of it and can pick it up and use it. So how can we engage the existing and potential research infrastructure users, researchers, sometimes also other parties, uh, to build the community and upskill in ways that benefit their research and to drive the future development of research infrastructure based on best practice approaches, including co-design, which is a key way we have been currently using to build these research infrastructures. So I'm wondering, are the slides following me? Yes, they're following me along. That's wonderful. Okay, great. Um, so the yesterday afternoon, we first focused on that research infrastructure workforce. So the people that are out there to, to actually support that research infrastructure and to build it. Uh, those are the, the enablers. And I think a key, key party in that whole discussion. So, Rosie, I'll, I'll give you a quick recap, especially for those that weren't here there, although I do see quite a few faces I saw yesterday afternoon. So I think... Rosie kicked off that discussion yesterday and said, well, look, these are key parties. Uh, they build the bridge between the research infrastructures and the user communities. And if you look at the draft National Digital Research Infrastructure Strategy, uh, if you're in the space, you generally call it the NDRI strategy. Um, and it actually, I was very happy when it came out because the first thing at the top of the list was the need for skilled researchers and a skilled research infrastructure workforce. So both sides were, em uh, were emphasized. And so uh, we've been puzzling about that and thinking about that. And that strategy emphasized the need for that workforce, uh, that research infrastructure workforce, that can provide smooth and efficient uh, delivery of equipment, platforms, services, and tools that ensure researchers can effectively access manage and analyze data. So by having that, um, uh, having, having them in place, they can handle the technical complexities and free up the researchers' valuable time and expertise uh, to do what researchers do best. So just looking at that discussion yesterday, uh, some of you uh, uh, were there, some of you uh, heard that discussion, you'll probably recognize this, I hope you'll recognize it anyway. Um, I'd say there were a few things that stood out for me, um, some of it was quite recognizable and some of those discussions were quite familiar, uh, but there were a few things there that I picked out and I went, oh, actually, I think we probably need to think about that a bit further and use that a bit further. So this workforce requires a broad mix of skills, uh, a range of skills, some of them technical, some of them discipline related, but also some of them softer skills like communication skills and translation skills, being able to bridge between the discipline needs and the technical implementation and how you bring that together. So I think that was a that was an useful perspective to keep in mind. Um, to get those skills is not just a matter of following training courses. There's probably not sufficient training courses in all those areas out there. So it's you need a bunch of different models there. And um, Helen, I thought, I, I love the perspective of the partnerships and achieving that through partnerships and work, you bringing in the, the relevant organizations and using other organizations out there in this space and connecting up. Um, using a mix of ways of building those skills through internships, work placements, exchanges, communities. These are all tricks you can use to ensure that people actually build those skills. Um, having that discipline knowledge is valuable, is great, um, but it and Tim, Tim Rawling, uh, he, he, pri he provided that, that perspective of uh, um, uh, bringing in the discipline researcher and assuming that they'll automatically uh, pick up programming skills and other skills. I thought it was a, a quite a funny, uh, funny perspective. His, his view there was, yes, 
you can bring in the discipline skills, that's great, but you need more than just those discipline skills. And people need to want to build that broader skill set. And if you look in that research infrastructure workforce, what you see is people generally that stick around because they have a passion, a passion for what they're doing, they care about what they're doing, and they care about the research, care about enabling that research, being proud about the research that's actually been achieved through this. And to ensure, to show to the research community uh, and potential people that might want to enter that workforce, it's important to be able to tell stories of impact, impact that has been achieved by the research infrastructure together with the researchers. This is not something that's achieved solely by the infrastructure, but in partnership with the researchers and other parties, uh, showing that impact that has been achieved. So that was setting the scene. That was a first. Yes, you're right. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, Let's see, where were we at? Okay. So, um, that was a perspective from yesterday. Today, we're going to be focusing more on the researchers and how we're going to build those researcher skills. And to give you a bit of perspective, first of all, I'll give you a general intro to ARDC and a little bit of background on the thematic research data commons. I think it's going to be helpful to understand why we've picked off these examples and these projects. So for those that don't know the Australian Research Data Commons, we are an NCRIS facility funded under the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy. And we, um, um, here we go. So we are the leading facility uh, for research data infrastructure at the national level. And we try and facilitate access to research data, asset, uh, dat data sets and tools from academia, industry and government for all Australian researchers. So we do a lot of work through programs and partnerships to ensure that res Australian researchers are in internationally competitive and have access to those high quality data assets, platforms, infrastructures, policies, but also people and skills. we go. So that's reflected in our, in our mission and our, uh, and, our, um, uh, and our purpose. So indeed to provide Australian uh, researchers with competitive advantage through data. And as we've been going through a shift recently, getting a lot of questions from the, the sector out there asking what is ARDC focusing on? What are you actually doing? What is your priority for the coming period? This is something we've come up with, which hopefully, prov hopefully provides a bit of perspective. First and foremost, you'll see the thematic research data commonses, but what we're also doing is building the work we've already done around the uh, Nectar Research Cloud. So we see this as a key part of data infrastructure that enables researchers to do their analysis, and we're building out the, op um, the, the opportunities that the Research Cloud provides. We are continuing our work around national information infrastructure, um, which is a bit of a code word for data discovery services, uh, services that enable data interoperability. Think of things like uh, vocabulary services, uh, disciplinary specific discovery services, and persistent identifiers that will enable the connecting up of information about research and data. And Last in that list, but definitely not least important, from my perspective anyway, is skills. So making sure that researchers and that research infrastructure workforce have the skills that are required to build the digital research, that data infrastructure that we're trying to achieve. So first on that list was those thematic research data commonses. We get quite a few questions, what is a thematic research data commons? It's a capability we're building at a national scale uh, to bring together the data, the tools, the models, the compute that researchers need to do their analysis. Very much aligned with a theme, a specific area of research, but, and one thing I stress and emphasize, and I'm very happy on this slide, is first and foremost is the people that make it happen. So think about the research infrastructure workforce, but also the researchers and building the skills of those researchers to actually use 
uh, use that research infrastructure and to help build it and design that research infrastructure. There's the people skills to that, but there's also the, the policies and the arrangements and the governance arrangements uh, that are required to have a shared understanding of how the data can be used, how the data can best be manipulated, and uh, what happens with those analysis, the analysis and the outcomes of that analysis. So we have three of these thematic research data commonses. The people, which is in um, health and medical space, the planet, which is in earth and environmental space, and the Hass and indigenous research, which is in obviously in the humanities, arts, social sciences, and indigenous research. So the first one for today is going to be about the People RDC, so that's about uh, health and medical research. So I hope this gave you a little bit of a perspective why we've taken the angle we have, and uh, I'm, I'll now hand over to Amani, because uh, she's leading the work uh, around skills for the, the people RDC. So, Amani, it's over to you now. Cool. Hello, everyone. All right. So, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Amani Gudavossos, and I'm the skills development lead at ARDC for People Research Data Commons. And thank you for everyone joining us in person and online today. So... Awesome, my slides are up. Perfect. So just, just a fair warning, things may get a little acronym heavy throughout the day, and I just wanted to point out that on the last page of the welcome pack, there is an acronyms cheat sheet. So if you look behind you there and on the side, we've got the QR codes for the welcome pack. Um, and feel free to go through that, and on the last page, feel free to use the acronyms cheat sheet whenever you need it. Um, so today I'm excited to share with you um, all the transformative work that's been undertaken by People Research Data Commons, or People RDC for short, and there's your first acronym. So at the core of People RDC is a commitment to addressing critical challenges in digital health and to support research and to support health and biomedical researchers in solving some of Australia's biggest societal and medical challenges. So overall, it's about building a comprehensive ecosystem that includes tools like upskilling materials, best practices, and best practices to empower researchers. And we approach this um, from multiple different angles, such as improving access to health and research data, building national infrastructure for clinical trials, and creating advanced analytical frameworks. I think this is the there we go. And um, from this, we've identified key fo uh, four key focus areas um, for Australia health researchers, and these include the um, discovery of data assets. So this is what researchers need the discover and the discoverability of assets. Um, secure access, which includes technologies that researchers can use securely. Integration, so how researchers can bring together data from different sources to create impactful and meaningful outputs. And finally, the use of cutting edge analytical tools, which will be a predominant factor for future research. So to address these focus areas, the People RDC has partnered with a wide range of universities and research and government institutes to build digital research infrastructure to support these research communities. And today I'm happy to introduce to you our presenters who are our partners in two of our flagship activities, which include the National Health Data Hub, that's NHDH, and Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, and that's Hassanda. So they'll be talking to us today about these amazing infrastructure projects and the barriers they face to increasing user engagement and effective use of their platforms. So first up, um, I'd like to introduce you to Caitlin Sigetsvari, um, and she is the Unit Head Director at the National Health Data Hub and at the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. She comes with 20 years experience in the Australian Public Service and has led numerous teams responsible for data acquisition, management, government, uh, governance, integration and analysis. Additionally, she is the current AIHW da uh, data custodian of the National Health Data Hub linkage system. So please welcome Caitlin, who is currently online. Can everyone see my slides? Yes. Great. Yay, fantastic. Apologies for, for all of that. Um, so yes, I um, thank you again for this lovely um, invite. Um, as I mentioned, or as was mentioned, I'm the data custodian of the National Health Data Hub. Um, if we're playing acronym bingo, 
uh, NHDH should be well and truly high up on the on the winners board. But um, we are very excited to be actually launching the National Health Data Hub today um, of all days. So ho um, hot off the press um, is the the first release of the National Health Data Hub, and I'll talk you through um, today what that is. Um, normally in our presentations we give an uh, quite a in-depth summary of what the national health data is, what it contains and so forth. I'll be doing a light touch today because the focus of this conference is about um, the skills that you'll need to use the, um, the National Health Data Hub and um, how we seek feedback and um, essentially who are our current users of the National Health Data Hub. So if you are after more information, I strongly encourage you to um, go to our newly launched website that was um, that came about, I think, um, late last week. The days are running into a bit of a blur at the moment. Um, all the information should be up there. More resources are going to be added over the next couple of days um, under our resource page as well. So if you do need any additional information, please head that please head to that website. Alternatively, we do have slide packs about the National Health Data Hub that um, we can share with you if you're interested. All right, so um, I won't go into detail today about um, what the National Health Data Hub aims to deliver. It aims to deliver many things, um, but some key highlights for us is about better coverage and expansion of data. So for those researchers that have previously used our linked um, asset that was referred to as the NISI. Um, the National Health Data Hub is essentially a rebranding of that, but it also has um, and will be working towards including more and more data modules into our linked asset. So um, we are looking at better coverage. So the NISI was always a start point from 2010 onwards. Um, we are looking to expand those reference periods to be before 2010. Um, and the expansion of data modules, so the different topics of um, health and welfare data you'll see um, expand over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, another thing to highlight is um, the secure access environments for which the National Health Data Hub is, are available from provides access to both government and non-government researchers. Um, access for non-government researchers, um, we've worked really closely with um, an ARDC project called the LINDA project, um, which was a collaborative effort with the University of New South Wales, and that worked towards um, working through the government uh, governance arrangements for national um, for non government researchers to have access to the national um, to the then NISI and then the National Health Data Hub um, from uh, this week. The other thing that I will um, just call out is the greater interoperability between state and territory linkage nodes and other existing linkage um, assets, such as the one housed at the ABS known as the PLIDA and the um, yet to be released National um, Disability Data Asset. So the National Health Data Hub is built on a spine based on the Medicare Consumer Directory, and that spine is also shared or um, is accessible via the ABS and is the infrastructure for the NDDA. And so um, what it means is that the data or the content, analytical content data can be shared um, within these um, linkage assets without requiring uh, personal identifiers to be shared, which is um, a, a fantastic advancement um, in this space um, and reduces um, the governance required. I'm not saying there's no governance required, but it definitely um, helps when you don't need to share personal identifiers among um, organisations. Um, the principles of the National Health Data Hub, um, again, I won't go through these um, uh, one by one, but I will call out that we um, do strive to adopt the share once and use many times with our data custodians. So what we mean by that is we are really working hard for data to be shared only once to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare or to another organisation. And then we use that interoperability element to be able to share data across um, platforms and systems. So um, we have new pipeline, pipelines in place and authorizations um, and governance we're working towards to be able to share that information um, under the appropriate approvals as much as we can. Um, the data sources included in the National Health Data Hub um, are very um, health and welfare focused. So we have 
um, information from our National Aged Care Data Clearinghouse. Um, that is beyond the residential data that um, was only available in the NISI. That's expanded to a number of aged care service programs. So we have home care um, and uh, assessment-based um, uh, data as well and a number of um, other things. So the aged care data has definitely um, quadrupled in size. We are um, finally releasing Australian Immunisation Register information as well. We've been promising that for about 12 months. There were a few hiccups in um, supply uh, through that um, chain, but that's now been all worked out and we're delighted to be able to release that um, today. And then um, the NISI um, and the National Health Data Hub share the common Commonwealth data sets such as um, PBS and RPBS, so the pharmaceutical information, the Medicare benefits schedule, the National Death Index, and of course, the all important state and territory hospitals data. Um, like the NISI, we have near national coverage of state and territory hospitals data. Um, it's essentially the East Coast is very dominant and we're working very closely with Northern Territory and WA to include their data, um, hopefully within the next um, 12 to 18 months. Um, we are also working um, with a number of data custodians to expand the data modules offered with the National Health Data Hub to include disability data, cancer data, COVID-19 case data, intensive care information, mental health data and perinatal data. Um, like all linked um, infrastructure and linkage systems, there are things that you can and can't do. Um, our governance arrangements for the National Health Data Hub um, stipulate that um, the data can be used for health research and a st statistical analysis for the purposes of planning, monitoring and evaluation um, for health policy development. Um, performance and health outcomes um, can be undertaken but at the national level. Um, and there's a number of um, pathway analyses and monitoring variations that can be undertaken. Um, like all linkage systems, there are a number of can'ts that can't be done. So the infrastructure is not intended to report and identify individuals or service providers and clinical practices um, and hospitals. It's not meant to be used for individual diagnosis and medical conditions um, and uh, for comp compliance reporting. So it really is that population um, level aggregate analysis um, is the intention and use for the linkage system. Um, so we were asked to give some information on how the system's been used in the past. And so um, this slide just provides um, some examples of how the, the NISI and the now National Health Data Hub has been used. So um, essentially one of the projects that um, was undertaken was to understand if people um, who survived a chronic heart disease event are following the clinical um, guidelines of the prescribed um, multi-drug regime. Um, this project aimed to explore patterns of medication use among a cohort of people discharged from hospital following a, a chronic heart disease admission. Um, this analysis could not have been undertaken without the linkage of hospitals data with the pharmaceutical benefits schemes data. Um, the graph illustrates that the analysis found that 61% of people with a chronic heart disease event were dispensed three or more of the recommended cardiovascular medicines within 40 days of leaving hospital. There is an ongoing analysis underway to examine the association between medication adherence and subsequent health outcomes. Um, so essentially, um, this was quite um, an, an astonishing piece of work to find out that only 61% were adhering to um, the medication guidelines and further work has been undertaken to understand um, the barriers um, or reasons behind um, or influences and key factors um, influencing um, that, that outcome. The National Health Data Hub or the, the then NISI has also been used to explore health services used in the last year of life for the general population, which I have an example for in a minute, and those who died by um, suicide and understanding factors influencing patient outcomes um, of health and aged care services and improving the identification of people with um, 
other health conditions such as dementia. So the other example that I have um, is um, in relation to people with um, younger onset dementia. And so um, the, the National Health Data Hub um, can be used to define populations of interest where typically information is very limited. So um, a good example is um, analysis that was undertaken to um, understand young people with dementia. The linked data in the National Health Data Hub provided a new opportunity to present more comprehensive picture of people with younger onset dementia by identifying those who were dispensed dementia specific medications um, through the PBS under um, the Australian government um, benefits scheme. So this graph um, showed that most people, so around 95% in the younger onset dementia cohort were living in the community when dementia specific medication was first dispensed in 2011-12 um, and with 5% living in permanent residential care. However, by the fifth year after medication was first dispensed, 42% of people were then living in the community and 31% were living in that permanent residential aged care. So there is a period there of once um, that medication is dispensed for the first time, that five year transition period, moving from uh, more people living in the community to um, more people living into um, uh, permanent resident, residential aged care. The last example that I have, and I mentioned it earlier, um, was the National Health Data Hub's been used to explore patterns of health services used in the last year of life for people who had died by suicide. Um, the main value out of this project compared to earlier studies comes from the fact that the linked hospitals data, Medicare benefits schedule, um, and the pharmaceutical benefits scheme data um, was able to be able to be linked with the deaths data. This report showed that people who had died by suicide accessed fewer health services in their last year of life than those who had died by other causes. So some interesting use cases there um, in terms of how the system's been used. There are many other use cases um, available on the AIHW website um, and we provide a, a list of projects on the, on the website that um, are approved and being undertaken within the National Health Linkage um, data system. And so uh, we list all public reports for all of those projects. So if you jump onto the website, you'll be able to see more and more um, ways that the linkage system's been used. So moving more to the topic of the conference at hand, um, the um, National Health Data Hub is available in two environments. One is specific to AHW users um, and some state and territory um, government users are um, using that at the moment. And that's the remote only network or the RON system, which you may hear about. But for external um, researchers, we make the National Health Data Hub data available through an AHW managed instance of the secure environment for analysing seed, up uh, analysing data. So otherwise known as seed. So again, acronym heavy, but um, you have probably heard of the term seed. It's an ABS um, delivered infrastructure and we have a pod within that, that the AHW manages. Um, and so the um, standard software that's available in Seed is R, Python, and LibreOffice. So LibreOffice is very similar to Microsoft Office, but with some nuances. And so um, when researchers come to use this infrastructure, it's just be mindful that um, it, it is LibreOffice. And so when you come to producing your aggregate statistics and you're asking for that information to be output vetted, um, LibreOffice is the program of choice to ask for those aggregate, aggregate statistics to be output output released. So um, that's just some skills that you might need to um, become familiar with or some software that you might need to become familiar with. Um, optional software also um, can be made available um, and that includes SAS, Starter and Databricks. Um, we're currently exploring when um, Databricks needs to be used. Um, and it's typically for large scale data analysis projects or um, where projects require complex mythological um, processes to be to be run. While SAS has some computing power, Databricks can um, be absolutely more efficient. 
um, when dealing with very large data and complex methodological processes. Um, the users of the National um, Health Data Hub to date have been um, various and um, the majority have been government and non-government analysts and researchers and they come with a breadth of um, skills and knowledge such as um, epidemi epidemiology and biostatistics and medical research. However, we do have um, also in the uh, projects um, experts um, and other um, staff and it, with with different experiences so they can come um, from a policy background um, or a preventative um, and public health background as well um, the skills for the national health data hub um, uh, you know require a tool to be able to use it effectively require a sound knowledge and skill set um, researchers need to demonstrate an understanding of the data that's available. So if you have previous experience in analysing MBS and PBS data or even hospitals data, um, it is of your benefit to list that in your application process because um, under the five safes mechanism, there's um, safe people and we assess your familiarity with the data um, available in the linkage system. Um, other skills and knowledge, um, it's always great to have um, data experience and data literacy. So being able to understand how the complex data, fit, data sets fit together, statistical models that you'll use for analysis and potentially data visualization. Um, it's always good to have an awareness of data privacy and security and the mitigations that we have in place to maximize the privacy of individuals and organizations. Um, we have mandatory training that all researchers need to, to um, participate in before you are granted access to the National Health Data Hub, and we cover that privacy and security element as well. Um, research and analytical data skills are obviously key to analysing linked data, um, and so being able to formulate research designs and understanding research methodologies is always of benefit. Um, and then um, in some cases, understanding policy interpretation um, would be key in terms of what your research questions are. Um, the other question at hand for the conference was how do we go about gathering user input and feedback for the National Health Data Hub? Um, we do this in various ways. So I mentioned the Linda project er um, earlier. As part of this um, project, we sought for user feedback and potential researcher feedback through a survey. This was um, led and undertaken in collaboration with the University of New South Wales. And we've um, tried our best to incorporate and address some of the um, critical or um, uh, feedback that we received throughout that process. We currently track utilisation and outcomes of projects. So um, we get an understanding of timeframes. Are we getting a lot of amendments to lengthen projects? Are we hearing challenges with um, the access to data or um, being able to manipulate the data using particular code. Um, we analyse trends and identify areas for improvement. So we're looking more and more at what type of ingress information analysts want and whether it's appropriate to make that information available to the entire community rather than the, per the specific project asking for that. Um, we're finding that um, Funding calculators are a frequent request. Concordances with other geographic um, uh, metadata is of interest as well. So we've made that globally available within the linkage system. We also have a community of practice. And so we seek feedback at those forums to understand the limitations, strengths and future directions of where we should take um, the National Health Data Hub as well. We also in the future have some planned user feedback surveys. So we will be gathering insights um, on areas for improvement, um, the strengths and perhaps um, the support needs of researchers. Um, we are delighted to have a future project with ARDC to enhance the resources for researchers um, and you'll see vast improvements on um, the information and content available on our website over the next um, couple of years for the, the life of that project. Um, and we 
try our best to um, make as much enhancements to data and access and usability. So my team and, and especially myself, we're all ex-researchers, we're very passionate about making the linkage system is easy to use and is friendly to use. And so we're um, always very keen to have some innovative ideas on um, some of the improvements that can be made on the linkage system. So I think that's me. I'm very happy to take questions. Otherwise, Amani, I wasn't sure if that was at the end, but I'll let you, I'll stop sharing and let you. So now um, our next guests are here. Um, to talk to us today about the Health Studies Australian National Data Asset, or HACENDA, and the Health Data Australia platform, so HDA. <coughs> so that, believe me, the acronym cheat sheet will come in handy. So I'm honoured to introduce to you our three speakers on behalf of HACENDA, um, Nemanja Zivanov, who is an Associate Research Fellow at Deakin University and the Project Manager for the Mental Health Node, Katie Ozdowska, who is the MISCH Clinical Trials Node Manager and Project Manager for Melbourne Academic Centre for Health, and Matt Ishak, who is the Senior Project Officer at Monash University for the Helix team and the Project Manager for Monash Partners. So, yep, let's welcome Nem, Katie and Matt to the stage. I think first up is Nem. Okay, great. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the introduction, Zamani. Um, I think I can see my slides from here. So today, uh, I'll be talking to you about what is Health Data Australia. So I'll try my best in six minutes or less to go through the platform, explain how it works, its services, and the tools we use. So, oh, there it is. So Health Data Australia is a hub for clinical trial health data. So it's a bit different from the previous hub as this one is just for clinical trials and it was launched in July of 2023, last year. Now, what HDA is trying to achieve or is, is achieving at the moment as it's launched is what it's doing is it's enabling reuse of secondary of already collected uh, clinical trial data. And in that, it's trying to promote and enable discovery. Discovery, sorry, I'm trying to see my slides. Um, and it's trying to enable uh, to request uh, access for secondary users. So the data custodians, so researchers who are putting the data on the platform, we have the secondary users who are coming on the platform to see what's available and to reuse this data. We have a process for them to request access as well, which I'll touch upon in just a second. Now you might be thinking to yourself, what kind of data is sitting on the platform? Is this secure and how does this all work? Well, shortly to answer your questions, there's no actual IPD sitting on the platform. It's all in the form of metadata. So just the descriptors of, of the data sets that can enable secondary researchers to find and to hopefully uh, engage in data sharing practices through that. And who provides this metadata? Usually our partner organizations and researchers themselves so that we reach out on. Uh, to as nodes, and uh, we'll talk about nodes again later down the line in the presentation, but that's just effectively how we actually onboard data sets and provide a rich data set on the platform. So HDA falls under the general in initiative from the People Research Data Commons, and it is, as it was presented before, a national scale data infrastructure where Sorry, for health research and translation, it's hard to remember these things because there's a lot of acronyms as well. So let's get into some of the key features of HDA. Some of the key features of HDA is it's first that I think of is the user interface. It's very easy to utilize and to use and to, organ to sort of um, search for the database itself. So if you're a researcher that wants to reuse already collected data, it's very easy for you to search through NZCTR codes, you can search through different subjects, you can search through different keywords and find exactly what you want because at the moment I think we, are ha we have over 193 data sets onboarded, which is great news, and we have more coming every single day or week depending on the node. So the ease of access is a big uh, key feature of uh, HDA where you can actually find what you're looking for and you're not stuck in a sea of research where you know, you're just looking at data that you potentially or will not actually use or request. Another th key feature of um, HDA is again, the vast amount of data that's out there. So we have anything from cancer, 
trial data, we have mental health and some others that you can see on the slide there. Hopefully I tried to zoom it as much as I could so you can actually see it. Um, unfortunately, we won't be doing a demo today because they'll probably take way more than six minutes. I'm not sure if that's... Oh, here we go. So some of the services that uh, HDA uh, provides, uh, first and foremost is the data discovery, as I mentioned before, and the search engine that's built in the platform itself. So first and foremost, you can search from the search engine and look through all the data sets that are included. However, if you already know the author for the clinical trials that you want to contact or you want to collaborate with and enable data sharing, you can effectively just look through the authors that are enabled that are actually on the platform itself and find them that way instead of going through all the trials and knowing the exact name of the data set to begin with. The other key uh, service that HDA provides and that it's very difficult to sort of summarize quickly, but I'll try my best, is the data access request. As you can see, there's a big blue button there where for each trial or each clinical trial that you can see on the platform, you can request access to. And I explain how this process works in a bit, but it's great that that functionality is there, which where we take all of that work off the researchers, trying to email each other back and forth, asking numerous questions, a meeting 10 times to you know discuss the potential variables that could be shared as well. And finally, one of the key services is data integration. So what that means is, is effectively that you can treat your own uh, dashboard in, as your, in your login as a shopping cart. So you can go around looking for clinical trials, what you're interested in, and effectively submit expression of interest forms to most of them to uh, hopefully bring them all together and work on one project together. So now I'll be getting into some of the tools of how we actually enable all of this on HDA and how it works. So the bread and butter of HDA that I would like to think of is the ANZ-CTR API. So all of the information that you can see on each clinical trial uh, landing page comes from the ANZ-CTR database in the form of metadata. And I know effectively you can go on the ANZ-CTR and just look through everything that's on there, but it's presented in a much more palatable form where you can actually look through all of the descriptors of the study itself. However, you can see the data sharing statement um, as well uh, on there where it will indicate how long the data set is planned to be shared for, by whom, who to contact, so all this sort of key information that data custodians themselves hold the power to say, I want to share my data for X amount of years to X amount of people and these are the only variables that I want to share. So it's very data um, custodian heavy in terms of responsibilities and y you get to make the calls yourself. Next is the expression of interest form. And I thought this was really interesting to bring up as this is one of the main tools for requesting the data, as I mentioned. So after you click that blue big button, this is the form that you come up to. And this is everything that secondary researchers need to fill out in order to actually send it to the data custodian. Why this exists is effectively to, again, reduce the, the amount of work that data custodians need to do in terms of communication, where these forms co contain everything from uh, project description for the new project and how the data will be utilized and the potential outputs from that data. And the most important thing, as you can see on the far right, is the ethics. So if the a secondary researcher who wants to use the data set has ethics already approved, they can attach it as well. Or if they don't, they can mention that and that can be a key point of discussion with the data custodian that they're trying to get the data off from. And finally, if this works. So the, I guess the engine of HDA that I would like to think and the biggest tool of HDA are the nodes themselves as the nodes are the ones who actually mint the DOIs and they provide the connection, well not the actual connection, but they provide the amount of data sets from different disciplines, from mental health, again, to cancer. And as you can see, we have a vast array of them and I think my colleague Katie will get more into them and who, who we are and where we come from and what we do. But this is just a over general overview of the nine nodes across Australia, making sure that we cover all um, the whole spectrum of clinical trial. And finally, wh what does HDA, what kind of I impact does it have on health research? As you can see here, I've just mentioned some of the potential benefits and the one that sort of rings true to me is the accelerated research. So instead of going to get a new grant for the same study that someone's already completed and they're happy to share data for, you can effectively just request that data set in the first place. 
and you can reuse their data, therefore you wouldn't have to be doing repeated research. And that coincides with the third point of improving research um, efficiency as well, where it would save a lot of money in terms of just you know going to access data rather than writing up a grant, not getting it, and then you know all of your effort is gone to nowhere, whereas you can just search through and see if some data that you might potentially use in your grant is already available, and that might push you forward in terms of just having those variables on board and not having to do extra work on top. Finally, so with those two points, they heavily influenced the third one, which is the, or the second one, I should say, on the presentation, which is the collaboration opportunities that arise from effectively sharing your data. So hopefully all the projects that work stem from the data sharing will be collaborated on. And again, it would have pr produced new innovations and it will support innovation in the long term, providing a rich data source for all of us to use as effectively as possible because we all know that once the clinical trial is done and then they answer all of the questions, data usually sits in the data repository not to be looked at again. So this whole approach sort of tries to re-enable the data sharing and use the already collected data. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. I hope that's not a microphone. <laughs> okay, so um, my name's Katie Ozdowska and I'm the Mac Node uh, project manager. And I've been asked to touch on who are the Hassand Rural Health Data Australia users um, and what kind of skills and knowledge do these users typically bring with them? Um, I guess to understand the user groups, we need to know who's involved in Hassanda. Um, so when we look at the node partners, it gives you a really good understanding of, of the groups that we have. There are nine nodes in total and they represent over 72 health research organisations. Does that work? Oh, there we go. Um, so this is a, a further breakdown of that national structure. There are 16 clinical trial networks, 18 universities, 10 medical research institutes, 19 health service operators, um, and nine others, mainly infrastructure uh, services. And the MAC node alone has 19 institutional partners. So you can see their logos there. Um, and any researcher who is affiliated um, with one of those institutions or working across many, uh, multiple can contribute their clinical trial metadata. And the focus of uh, Hassander uh, at this point in time is on investigator-initiated academic clinical trials. So our user groups are generally clinician researchers. They've got dual roles or an academic position at a university, and then they work clinically and con conduct their clinical trials through the hospital or health service. So um, what are the profile? What's the profile of a primary researcher who is contributing their clinical trial metadata? Well, our formal metrics and reporting requirements are currently in development. I think they're due to kick off tomorrow. Um, but these are going to be really important um, uh, identifiers to, to identify our frequent users and focus on education for perhaps less engaged cohorts. Um, so I'll speak more to um, anecdotally and, and a node, um, our observations from a node um, and then from our interactions um, with contributing investigators. So one of the, the groups that has contributed the most metadata records for the MAC node is uh, from the Centre for Health, uh, Exercise and Sports Medicine at the University of Melbourne. And these researchers are mainly physiotherapists. They've got high rates of NH and MRC and MRFF grant success. They um, publish in really high impact journals quite frequently. And overall, they're a really progressive group. Um, they've got a positive culture towards data sharing. Um, they've already had pre-existing avenues to, to share data within their group. So they, when approached, viewed Hassanda as just another way to promote their research, increase their reach and visibility. Um, they also felt that responsibility to maximise the return on investment for publicly funded trials. And the biggest one that we've found, the kind of the biggest carrot is that they're, they're conscious of meeting their funder and journal publication requirements for sharing data, which is becoming increasingly common. So I'll take you through the profile of a, um, a secondary user. Um, 
accessing the Health Data Australia catalogue and I think it has um, a broader range rather than the primary uh, researcher or data custodians because here we're, sort of we're, looking for, uh, we're looking at early career researchers, those with varying degrees of expertise. Um, we might have researchers from different fields, epidemiologists, health economists, public health researchers um, who are interested in accessing that data and forming collaborations. And uh, at the risk of stepping outside of Hassanda for a moment, um, but I think this example just highlights the importance for progressing a platform like Health Data Australia. Uh, Professor Julie Simpson, who's a biostatistician, a mathematical modeler, she's the MAC node lead for Hassanda and a great Hassanda champion. Um, she's also a methodology advisor to the Infectious Diseases Data Observatory. And it's a, it's a widely used network amongst infectious diseases um, community. And through this platform, Professor Simpson has been able to facil facilitate complex meta-analyses um, on the efficacy of existing malaria treatments while informing new treatment options. So I think that's just uh, a, a good example of what's possible when platforms like this exist and how Hassanda and Health Data Australia can really open up the potential for collaboration across disciplines and what we'll come to expect from the platform. Uh, and what kind of pre-existing user skills and knowledge would the users of Hassanda and Health Data Australia possess? We'd be expecting um, that interacting with the Health Data Australia catalogue poses little challenge to the users. Nem took you through what that actually looks like, and it's not just a compliment to the, the DevOps team for, for its development. Um, but if you can purchase something off Amazon, you have the skills to navigate this catalogue and access request system. Um, and that's not to trivialise the process at all, the complexity comes after that. That's the easy part, is to, to search for the metadata and uh, press that big request access button. Um, but our users are going to be technically literate in their daily roles. They're going to be working across multiple databases, uh, navigating el multiple electronic medical record systems or using complex programs or software already. Um, they're also going to be familiar with completing data ac the data access request components, so um, preparing that detailed project proposal that includes the aims, hypotheses um, and pre uh, predicted outcomes. So where we're going to get the varying levels of proficiency among um, our users is uh, in the secondary analysis stage. So we might have advanced degree students, masters or PhDs, postdoc fellows, mid-career researchers or expert advisors um, up to professors with you know 30 years of experience. Um, I think you need a pretty comprehensive set of skills to undertake those secondary analysis depending on the complexity uh, and users may need additional support or education um, but that's going to be discussed with that primary researcher when you're requesting access. And I know the ARDC in collaboration with the Cochrane and NHM and MRC Clinical Trial Centre um, uh, had a program of work where they aimed to upskill researchers on how they approach secondary analysis in clinical trials data, which is going to be a great resource. And I think there's a webinar coming up uh, within the next two weeks. Um, I'm sure you can probably plug that in the chat or something. <laughs> um, and then institutions are also going to offer their own levels of skills and um, access to support and training. So uh, a little plug for the research hub that I work for, at Mi which is MISH at, at the University of Melbourne, Sense of Methods Implementation Support for Clinical Health Research. We can also um, assist with, with those areas as well. So I'll hand over to Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, uh, Nem, uh, Atmani. Thanks for the introduction, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll now talk to the skills uh, for supporting the Hassan Initiative and managing uh, the share safe sharing of, of the research data assets. So many researchers, and in this case, uh, clinical trialists, uh, for our, our use case, um, have existing skills uh, that are strong in the areas that are required. Um, Katie just talked through a lot of those just now. Uh, but this can be inconsistent and, and several areas of need have been identified where additional resources can be created to help skill, upskill any potential users of the platform. Uh, for example, primary researchers must review any submitted data access requests to ensure that they comply with the data sharing requirements and any ethical and legal considerations. They have the authority to approve or request the requests. And once a request is approved, the primary researcher must establish the terms of a data sharing agreement 
This agreement should clearly outline the conditions for the data sharing, ensuring both parties understand their obligations and responsibilities. So to effectively leverage the Health Data Australia catalogue, there was a focus on having standardised systems to assist with the review process, support any possible gaps in project data governance policy and ensure users are aware of the risks and have the tools to best manage aspects of the data requests and to integrate the metadata into the catalogue. To quote the FAIR principles, researchers spend considerable time, money and effort collecting, interrogating data, make, making your fi data findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, maximises the impact of that investment, including gaining more citations for your data sets. You cannot do this without the correct people and processes in place. And for this to work as intended, we need to ensure that we have the information at hand to understand what is required and the tools to navigate the requirements of the platform. Now, when I talk about data quality here, I would like to clarify I'm not talking about the integrity of the clinical trial data. I'm not here to question the data collection methods or research methods at all. With respect to this project, when we're talking about the data and metadata, we're talking about the information about the clinical trial data set. A data set description, a trial ID, key inclusion criteria, key exclusion criteria, etc. This is the metadata. This is the information we will make available on the Health Data Australia catalogue. And we're focused on the systems and processes for making that metadata available and the processes and skills needed to, for fielding requests and granting access for secondary use. We can also utilise the foundational principles of this project across more data types than just clinical trial data sets. We can show that this can be adapted by other research groups. In the current la landscape, a principal investigator, for example, may or may not have established processes for fielding data access requests. These could simply just come through via emails um, or, or random contact. By providing a structured platform for researchers to use, we can help to eliminate opportunistic requests for providing by providing clear instructions to a secondary researcher. NEM showed the, the form that needs to be filled out. It's quite extensive. And this helps uh, set the expectations of the secondary researcher for what would be required in submitting the request. So we now have the tools for Australian researchers to manage these requests in a safe and efficient manner. As a project and separately as nodes, we have made considerable effort to identify the support needed to upskill researchers. Stakeholder consultations were undertaken to provide a, a gap analysis to assess the needs of researchers and how the project could best fill those gaps. Several community engagement activities have been completed, both online and in person, to create awareness and avenues for accessing resources and tools. This is an ongoing endeavour and just for the Monash node alone, we have additional events planned right through to the middle of 2026. There have been additional methods used to allow researchers to utilise the platform proficiently. A collaborative design approach has allowed research infrastructure knowledge to be shared across the nodes too. This approach has led to some practical solutions. For example, Monash University and University of Melbourne now utilise the exact same application solution to automatically harvest the correct metadata and mint a matching digital object identifier for that data set. Katie was actually uh, a big part of ensuring the solution was made available for all nodes. Um, this solution helped to eliminate a massive technical hurdle for primary researchers wanting to share their data via Health Data Australia. It allowed nodes to create a relatively simple tool to complete what can be a tedious and technical process in a relatively simple and easy to understand manner. Overall, the main outputs for upskilling have centred around providing templates, standard operating procedures and policy guidelines. These include for both primary and secondary researchers. We focus on the skills mandatory for the project workflows and to better enable the efficient and safe sharing of the sensitive data. Many of the aspects I've talked about are from the perspective of the Monash node, <coughs> run and managed by Monash University in conjunction with Monash Partners. However, all nodes are using the same or similar solutions. Our organisations may require slightly different processes and strategies, but with the support of the AADC and active engagement of all the project partners, we identified commonalities and shared principles across the nodes. This collaboration and co-design has enabled us to work together on various uh, aspects such as the new infrastructure to support the automated DOI minting functionality, 
standardise the workflows for data access requests and templates for communications, uh, messaging and other support documentation. Investing in the knowledge of our researchers to better utilise the Health Data Australia catalogue is essential for staying ahead in the rapidly evolving landscape. As we advance our expertise collectively, we can better uh, navigate the complexities and ultimately contribute more impact uh, and to the research in the lands Australian landscape. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much to the Hassander team. That was really, really great. Um, just making sure we're ready to get started. So my name is uh, Rob Clemens. I'm the skills lead with uh, Planet Research Data Commons. And I joined the team about five months ago, so I'm kind of new to this space. But I'm really excited about um, the activities that Planet Research Data Commons are undertaking. So we're doing all kinds of work in the creation, analysis, retention, um, connection and sharing of data analytics and those associated um, data products. So there's a lot of cool activities that are happening, but I'm particularly keen on these next three presentations that we're going to have today. So um, these, it's been, so I've been an old bird watcher for a couple of decades. And technology is just starting to facilitate new things that I can do that I wasn't able to do previously. And these, these talks are tapping into that. So the first talk we'll hear from is on, is on biosecurity commons. And so biosecurity commons is providing um, analytics really rigorous science created at the University of Melbourne and translating that science to a much broader suite of users. So it's an excellent place where someone like me who does a bit of coding might be able to dip into some more complex methods um, and then create data products that can be shared online. The next presentation we're going to have is um, on the Wildlife Observatory of Australia. So one of the things that's happened in, in ecology is people are able to put a camera out and sensors will trip and take a picture of wildlife. Because of that technology, we're having wildlife show up in all kinds of cool places. But that data is highly siloed in Australia and what we're doing in this project is bringing all of that data together so it's much more powerful. You can do all kinds of cool things. And we'll have uh, someone talking about that later. And then the last talk we're going to have is on open ecoacoustics. And this is a project that's really close to my heart. So as a bird watcher, the way I used to collect data for the last 30 years has always been I went out with my binoculars and I counted birds. But now you can set out um, an acoustic, a passive acoustic recorder and do some magic processing that this project is working through and get a bird list. So all of a sudden, I'm going to be able to have my peers deploy these sensors at scale and I'll have more bird data than I ever dreamed possible 10 years ago. So um, those are the three talks and I just want to introduce our, our first speaker is James Kamak. He's here today. He's a chief investigator at the Center for Excellence in Biosecurity Risk Analysis here at the University of Melbourne. And in his free time, he manages the Biosecurity Commons project. So over to you, James. Thanks, Rob. Oops, let's get that button. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Rob's introduced me, I'm the project manager for this, this thing called Biosecurity Commons. Um, so before I tell you what it is, I'll provide you the context of why we want it. Uh, increasingly, globally, biosecurity risk is increasing, right? and that's largely driven to changes in human movement or increases in human movement in particular, increases in trade and changes in species distributions, whether it's caused by climate or habitat fragmentation. 
And research done by ecologists and invasion biologists has shown that this is increasing across most taxa, in many cases, linearly. We only need to look at what happened with COVID to see how quickly a new pest or a disease, in this case, can spread. And so governments globally have been really investing heavily into better uh, data and science for informing risk. And a lot of it has been focused on developing databases for uh, collating data sets that are collected by governments and industry, such as what Australia's got is the Auspest check. Uh, there's the Atlas of Living Australia for you know, general public um, alerts when they put in their occurrence records. We were also investing in new technology at the border for screening these 3D X-ray machines. We're using eDNA approaches, such as the IMAP pest, and we're de developing libraries of um, pest and disease images to help both industry, government, and the general public in identifying new pests and diseases as they come into the country. So this is all well and good, but what's missing? What's missing at the moment is that we don't have a standardised system for developing risk analytics for making decisions, particularly for governments making policies and new de uh, decisions in terms of regulations. And why is this? Well, largely, the cutting-edge research in terms of the risk analytics is done by academics for academics. It's written for, uh, and, uh, in papers in this complicated math, right, hidden behind paywalls often, Right, and I'm generally not accessible to the practitioners, the regulators, who need to use these models to inform how they do their post-border surveillance or their risk mitigation activities. And this has led to national inconsistencies in their application. Different state organisations, different industries apply different methods or no methods at all. And this has also led to limited uh, sharing of risk analytics and data and ultimately results into suboptimal outcomes for our nation in terms of our agricultural assets, our environmental assets and our social assets. So this is where this cloud analytics platform called Biosecurity Commons comes in. It's a cloud-based decision support platform for modelling and analysing biosecurity risk and response. It was launched about mid last year and it's uh, been funded by a variety of state, government, uh, uh, state governments, federal governments, ARDC uh, and a whole wealth of other different organisations which are listed here. What does it do? There we go. Um, basically, it's a platform that we've work, uh, consulted carefully with stakeholders, so end users, people that actually need to use these models to make decisions, as well as academics and researchers to develop a series of analytical workflows that they can use to make the, or inform their decisions. These include risk mapping, thinking about where a pest or a disease might first establish, thinking about its climate suitability, its biotic suitability, so the environmental suitability of the, the landscape. Um, what's the propagule pressure hitting the border? Where's it likely to disperse post-border? And that also feeds into species distribution models. So other suites of models that think about just modelling the climate suitability of a pest or a disease or an animal. It can feed into spread models for thinking about, well, if it does get into the country, where's it most likely to spread first? How far is it going to spread? How likely are we going to contain it? And then that can inform surveillance uh, design, impact analysis, resource allocation, uh, and ultimately make declarations of whether a pest or a disease is absent from a country given that we're doing a set of surveillance. The methods that we've integrated have been worked, uh, have been uh, in integrated onto the platform, have been developed in close collaboration with the different stakeholders that want to use these models and they're based on published or endorsed methods by governments and industry. And what we've done is we've basically translated that complicated math that you saw in that uh, article before uh, into easy to use tools on a cloud-based platform. And the best bit is that often these models are, uh, feed into other decisions or other models, so the outputs of one workflow can be an input into another. 
We also have over 60,000 different data sets that are available on Biosecurity Commons uh, shared with our sister platform, Echo Commons. Most of these are climate uh, uh, prediction layers globally, uh, but we've also got other layers such as land use layers, and also we've got API connections to a variety of occurrence records either collected from within Australia, such as Atlas of Living Australia, or globally, the bio, uh, Global Biodiversity Information Facility. So what are the key benefits of the platform? Well, it's cloud-based, so that means it's accessible to anyone. Um, whereas before, when these analytics were uh, being done, they were being done in-house on departmental computers or industry uh, uh, computers or a, a researcher's laptop, right, and not easily shareable because it would involve a whole heap of downloading, rel uh, a whole pile of different dependencies. It provides a platform that makes the work, the work, uh, the analytics, and the workflows reproducible. It's a data repository that has easy, uh, a, a wide range of data sets that are either publicly available or user uploaded and shared, right? And it's secure and shareable. So the other key point is that the analytics that are developed on this platform can be shared with different organisations or different individuals. And so this basically provides the opportunity of reducing redundancy or reinventing the will that's been undertaken by governments and industries at the moment, right? And it also allows for the opportunity for nationally endorsed standardised frameworks for inf uh, using these risk analytics for informing operations. So who are our intended users? Well, this is probably slightly different because our core res uh, end users are not researchers. Researchers get trained to develop their own code and their own models. They're what I would call the tool developers, the cutting edge analytics that they develop. Rather, our primary end users are governments, so state and federal, but as well as industry, not-for-profit organisations and environmental organisations. And each, th each of these three broad groups have different um, objectives. So governments are mostly interested in how they can use the risk analytics to inform their operations and their policies. Industry want to use the, the platform and the analytics to understand what the risk is to their assets, whatever that is. And universities and research centres want to use the platform to get their latest cutting edge tools used, but also universities want to train the next generation of practitioners from uh, managing biosecurity risk in Australia and globally uh, uh, more generally. So how are we engaging these different groups? Well, we've been running, uh, uh, when we developed Biosecurity Commons, we ran these stakeholder uh, or uh, user requirement workshops to work out exactly what they wanted on the platform. So they were involved from conception. We also uh, are currently collaborating with these different end users to develop real world case studies. So we're holding their hand, showing them how to use the platform and in doing so training them to use the platform, but actually solving real world problems with them. And the best thing about this is by doing this, we ultimately end up with exemplar examples that can be then made accessible to other um, individuals or organisations for thinking about how can I use the platform to solve their own problems. Of course, we do the standard things of doing uh, con conference presentations, we do live demonstrations to groups and we run training workshops online, face to face, we do all those sort of things. And more recently, we're investing into developing short how-to videos that are directly embedded on the platform. Because when you go to any type of platform, when you first get there and you've never seen it before, it's a bit of a daunting experience. So we're having videos embedded on the platform that walks the user through how, how to run a risk map, for example, helps get over that um, the initial cognitive bias. And lastly, what were the challenges that we're facing uh, at the moment? Well, we want to build a, a you know, vibrant end user community. But the challenge that we're finding, particularly working with governments, is they have high turnover. They often lack the capacity to run these um, uh, analyses themselves, mostly because it's coming from, oh, it's a risk analytics uh, thing, it's maths, it's complicated, it's too hard. 
And that's because often, if we go back to what I originally was saying, most of the risk analytics have been developed for, uh, by academics, for academics, and there's this initial inertia of going, well, I don't know anything about risk analytics, I won't even touch the platform. So we need to break down that barrier. And the part of the way we're doing that is running these user case studies, developing these YouTube videos and y these training sessions. But it's a slow process. The other challenge that we're having is data sharing and collaboration. The platform is optimal for allowing sharing of uh, uh, data if, if um, organisations or data owners want to share it, but uh, particularly with collaboration because the different analytics can be shared across jurisdictions, so we don't get into the situation where one jurisdiction, say Victoria, develops one risk map for a fruit fly and a different, a different uh, state does the same risk map but using a different pile of assumptions and there's no standardisation. The problem that we have in terms of both data sharing and collaboration is that there is a mistrust particularly between industry and government and it also among governments, between Commonwealth and the state government agencies. No one wants to be in the situation of getting their ass kicked um, by sharing data, particularly from a government perspective. And so we need to try and work with them and, and build up that trust in order to be able to get data shared more freely, at least among different government agencies and industry. And the last uh, major hurdle that we're facing is sustainable funding. And this is going to be across most of the platforms that we've discussed today. Who pays? And ultimately, when uh, through my conversations through government and industry, we need to do a really good job of what is the value proposition? Why? What am I going to say right, by investing in the maintenance or enhancement of any platform. And so that's the challenge that we're facing right now. And the way we're currently trying to tackle it is by developing these use cases and going, well, now, look, you've got a transparent way of making decisions that are informed by cutting edge science and risk analytics. We'll leave it there. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Rob. I'm very happy to be here. Wish I was there in person. Um, I have spent the last 15 years trying to study animals that don't want to be seen and trying to escape uh, from humans. And so luckily that coincided with the rise of a sampling method called camera traps, or what I like to call them is just wildlife cameras. They're not really a trap. Um, and so starting in other countries, I worked for a long time realizing that if we all combined our camera trap data together, we can monitor wildlife much more uh, effectively and answer questions that is not possible uh, to sample everything yourself. And so when moving to Australia and trying to um, engage with a similar network of people here, uh, we kind of realized that there wasn't a group of people uh, sharing data, uh, making uh, larger and longer term data available. So we couldn't answer those questions. So we started this initiative that we call the Wildlife Observatory because it really is like an observatory, bunch of cameras all over the world, or in this case, all of Australia, um, recording what they what they see. And then we transform that into spreadsheets and data that we can analyze through time for monitoring purposes and to answer research questions. So let me give you a little bit more background and then talk about our users and um, our obstacles, hurdles so far and how we're addressing them. Okay, why do we need a national wildlife database? Was it to deliver information for robust monitoring science and management? And that really matters in Australia. So uh, one of the tools that uh, recently created in Australia that has been really well received and used by government to monitor species is the Threatened Species Index. They require data sets collected the same way through time to look at species abundances. We also need that to feed into things like a threatened species strategy um, for recovery of threatened species. We also need to manage our invasive species, which you know can cost us billions of dollars per year. Uh, we need it for our scientists to write impactful research papers. Um, we need it for sharing with our um, with our public so they can access information about their biodiversity in their country. 
and we need it to meet our biodiversity um, UN commitments. We also need it in more timely ways. So Australia has seen a variety of dramatic events and we are likely about to see a few more. Um, and so we need to be able to respond to things like bushfires. We need to be able to respond to disease outbreaks. And the last talk about the biosecurity commons was a great intro for that. We need better track changes due to climate change. And we want to be able to sell biodiversity credits alongside carbon credits. And to do so, we have to be able to track, quantify biodiversity and change through time. All this can be uh, improved with wild for wildlife through the use of cameras. So as a quick example to get us started, I just want to talk about one, um, one thing that we were involved in to give you an idea of how this can be used. So to look at how the 2019-2020 Black Summer fires um, that swept through the East Coast of Australia impacted wildlife, WWF and Google collaborated on a you know, million dollar plus program to use cameras to sample wildlife um, in areas that were affected and areas that weren't. And so this was a massive endeavor leading to many millions of images. And so uh, we were tasked with trying to make sense of this. And so we went through a process of collating all that data, standardizing it and analyzing it. And because we had been working on similar data sets, we're able to produce a turnaround time of under two, or under eight weeks. And I think today that would be down to about two weeks um, to deliver these kind of results that assess the impacts of fire on animals. And so that's what we're really trying to bring to the larger Australian um, community. So let me just dive in really quick so you get an idea of how much data is truly uh, created. So camera traps are really easy to set. Strap them to a tree and turn them on. And they sample so many different species. That can lead to a single survey having more than 100,000 images. We actually used to use video. Video is even better because you can look at behavior. But the data was just too, it got too rich, too much data. Um, so you get all, even if you're using images, you still get so much data. And um, what that leads to is, uh, this quarter, this uncoordinated but very um, uh, widespread network of camera trap studies. And what we're realizing is actually almost half of these have never even been published or not accessible when we sent out a questionnaire to all the camera trap users around Australia. So there's lots of sampling being done, but it's not always leading to, you know, outputs. And when we looked at camera use in Australia through time, we see a steady increase. Um, and so this really leads to a conclusion that camera traps are easy to use. People are using them a lot, but they're generating unmanageably large data streams and leading to relatively few impactful outcomes. So um, they're also being used in a larger and larger variety of research applications from biodiversity research, you know, just looking at um, species trends through time, but also management. How, how are, you know, a dingo fence or the application of uh, baits to kill invasive species, how are those performing relative to others? Uh, and monitoring, you know, how are, how are uh, wildlife communities changing with climate change, with fires, with um, urbanization? And so who's using cameras? Well, everybody. So um, a huge user is NGOs, um, from global ones to local ones, um, government um, and government agencies across the board. I mean, from the Brisbane City Council, where I'm at right now, where you work with them on their camera trap deployments to look at how wildlife is using riparian areas, to the New South Wales government that has, you know, a parks, looking at biodiversity in a good way, to the DPI, Department of Primary Industries. They have an invasive species management department. They actually set more cameras than anybody, probably in all of Australia, and that is to manage, to monitor and manage invasive species. So consultancies. So let's say there needs to be an environmental impact assessment before a mining contract. They need information about wildlife before and after or wildlife that could be affected if there's a threatened species that might hold up their approval for development. Academics, of course, that's that's obvious. And then a very increasingly large group is indigenous organizations, especially ranger groups. So very wide user group. And um, just to jump back really quick, this user group varies dramatically in their training for the use of technologies and especially statistics and maybe data management. Um, so uh, our, our three main tasks, um, I'm trying to keep organizing all the things that we're doing, is to acquire, 
and aggregate the raw data from many sources. And that can come in the shape of images or the spreadsheets describing those images. And as you can see, we're, we're likely, based on our identified key stakeholders that want to participate in our endeavors, going to increase that exponentially over the next few years, which is a scary uh, thought uh, for us. But um, then we want to provide our stakeholders with cleaned and standardized data sets, as well as reports that just describe their data sets um, and maybe some key findings. And then we want to make it accessible for, our, for the public or for at least researchers with um, the right credentials through existing places that people go to find similar data, like ALA, like TURN, which is a terrestrial ecosystem research network. They provide a variety of access to survey data. Um, and we also want people to be able to access this data through uh, platforms that allow them to analyze it themselves. So two examples are eco commons and biosecurity commons. So we need to prepare the data and then provide access to it through APIs so that people can um, analyze it themselves. All right, so um, we want to address with ARDC Planet the following key needs, coordination and collaboration in sampling. There's a lot of people setting cameras in the same place or a similar um, rationale that never talk to each other. There's not even a, re um, a registry to find out who is sampling and for what in your in around Australia. That's a key first step. Then we need uh, image storage and efficient, efficient processing and species identification. So talk a little bit more about that. We need to address how people are sampling different ways. And then they're processing their images in different ways. We recently just um, started a project trying to look at cassowary range contraction. And we got sent a data set and they deleted all the other pictures of everything except for a cassowary. So we couldn't then use that to tell if there are threats like dingoes or cats or um, pigs or competitors. Um, so we need to make sure that people are processing their data in similar ways. Then we need to uh, facilitate collaboration among people for longer term and larger scale uh, monitoring. That means um, creating databases where people can contribute and download, creating spaces for people to meet each other, creating meetings for people to share their experiences and their um, recent research. Then we also, this is huge, need to support advanced statistics for impactful and robust research. So um, almost half of the existing, of the recent research published to date and reports that are coming out use statistics that have been shown to be quite um, biased and there are improved statistics available, but they're not that easy to use. And so we wanna provide, first of all, we just wanna provide the results to people and I'll explain more about that. Then we wanna provide training and um, capacity building for people to use uh, more modern um, techniques. People who are interested, those modern techniques all fall into one category called hierarchical modeling. It means that we estimate not just the capture rate, but we split that into how detectable is a species? And then given that information, how um, much of our territory do we think is occupied or how many, or what do we think our abundance of our animal is? So once we detect an animal once, we know it's occupying that area. We might never detect it again. That means it's got a very low detectability in that site. That means the next camera a kilometer over doesn't detect the species doesn't mean the species isn't there, just means we're probably never gonna find it anyway. Our detectability is very low. So that concept, um, there's statistics that address that and that's what we're trying to promote. Okay, so if we group that into three categories, I can think of it as images. We need infrastructure programs, training and support for people to store, organize and identify the millions of images they're collecting monthly. That means we need cloud-based AI image identification platforms. These exist. They are not suitable for Australia and all of our needs right now. So we need to help create this capacity. We need data aggregation and sharing. So we need um, interoperability within an organization or among, among you know, different people within the government and externally. So between academics and government and NGOs. That means we need data standards we need MOU so we could actually share data. And importantly and expensively, we need API so we can, if we actually accomplish this, send data to each other. Um, and we want that data then to be searchable and accessible via existing platforms like ALA in turn. Um, so we also need robust analytics. 
So we want to be able to derive inferences, which means we need to prepare our data, run the great, run the appropriate statistics, and then make results that are intuitive for people to interpret. So we want to automate reports. So if people provide their data, we can provide them back a report that utilizes, you know, cutting edge stats. So make it really easy for people to have great reporting um, and information. We want to make this publishable for people and, and make it really easy to publish so that uh, inferences can be shared. We want to be able to feed these inferences to the people that matter, like the federal government for the um, uh, Endangered Species Act that could halt you know, development in some area if we are finding rare endangered species on a piece of land that was uh, targeted for development. Um, we want to be able to contribute to public indices like the Threatened Species Index um, that's run by TURN. That's been a huge success, like I mentioned earlier. And we want to train, we want to improve capacity for people who are interested in doing these stats themselves, we want to provide room for training. Um, and um, yeah. So we also just need to provide not just APIs, but information and hold uh, meetings to make it really clear that we can connect all these stakeholders to make things much more efficient and make the existing collection of data get a lot more mileage because it can be shared among all these different groups. Okay, that was a quick overview of our project. I wanna really thank um, the people who are in charge of the Planet ARDC um, uh, initiative, especially Hamish, Joe Morris and Rob, been so helpful. And then I wanna really thank Zach and Tom, two um, postdocs in the group that have helped prepare these slides and have been influential throughout this process. Thank you. Excellent. Um... Yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about how we've built the eco acoustics community, and a lot of that um, follows on from um, what Matt has said. Um, let me um, let me start by acknowledging the traditional owners of where I am, the Turbul and Yagara people. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. And in the eco acoustics work I do, we often partner um, as much as possible with uh, traditional owners. The um, uh, eco-acoustics is really about, it's sort of complementary to the camera trap work, which Matt's just talked about. It's about um, understanding faunal bi biodiversity through uh, long-term audio recording. So we put sensors out into the environment. Uh, we continuously record audio and try to make sense of the vocal species that we can hear from the audio. So it's really a new way to understand our world. Um, it's a uh, it's a sort of a scalable technique in that we can put out as with the camera traps we can put out recorders we can put out these devices to find out more about what's um, going on, but it's also a rather young technique. So it's not something which is sort of described in um, ecology textbooks and things. So we're really still trying to figure out how to do it and how to do it well. Um, there are some sort of unique issues. We do collect um, a large data. Uh, because often we're continuously recording, so we collect sort of years, hundreds of years of sort of data, um, and it's sort of progressing uh, rapidly. Let me see if I can actually play some. Oh, I think I've forgotten to share my audio. Apologies. I think I have to just keep going. But anyway, that um, that thing you can see at the bottom there is a spectrogram, um, and that's a visual representation of some sound, and there's a beautiful uh, morning chorus there. I'll just not showing the sound. Um, so when we um, talk about ecoacoustics, uh, with which the Open Ecoacoustics Project being supported through the AIDC, we often sort of put up this slide, um, which sort of shows um, sort of a koala, and it shows the kind of I guess the complex landscape that ecoacoustics is part of. There are um, uh, a lot of uh, difficulties associated with the actual um, data pipeline that I'll talk about. There's also a lot of um, other parties involved. We've got different kinds of users, whether they're environmental agencies or landowners or researchers, again, as sort of Matt has sort of previously said. Um, and it's also just part of the workflow in that there are downstream um, parts of that workflow that once you've made your recordings, uh, we then want to feed the data into things like the Atlas of Living Australia or into sort of the Eco Commons ARDC project. So it's quite a kind of complex um, landscape that we're operating in. In terms of the actual um, 
data and the workflow, I guess in a sort of simple form, it, it looks like this, that we're putting out um, recorders and they may be the sort of, this is on the left, these sort of solar powered permanent recorders, or they may be a much sort of smaller portable battery powered recorder. Uh, we're then collecting um, a whole bunch of sort of SD cards containing the data. That data then needs to be stored, for example, in the um, Open Eco Acoustics platform, the data analyzed. And then once the data has been analyzed, we then need to sort of visualize the data. We need to sort of plot or graph it, or we need to actually get that data into um, some sort of downstream um, sort of tool or service like kind of Eco Commons or the ALA. So in terms of um, users and the issues they have, with the users have got sort of issues um, right along this pipeline. So we have users who are interested in the kind of hardware and hardware recommendations in the sort of where to and, and how to organize the design for their data collection, um, how to um, uh, manipulate the data once they've collected it because they need to sort of um, transcode it into some sort of different format, uh, how to store the data, um, what are the sort of settings on the devices they should use, um, how to um, analyze the data, um, working out what might they actually sort of hear, what might they hear, um, how to use tools like BirdNet, uh, many, many sort of things. So it's all about both the sort of the hardware, the software, the services, the design of the system and how then to sort of get the data into other systems. Um, so in terms of who our users are, we've got a wide variety of users. Uh, again, sort of analogous to what Matt was saying, we've got sort of some users who are um, running kind of large long-term projects, say um, in, um, in sort of government and agencies, they may be long-term projects, they may be quite wide scale and looking at many species. And I guess at the other end of the scale, we've got things like individual research students who basically do everything themselves and they're working at a university, they're interested in research, it's a smaller scale project and maybe focusing on just a sort of single species. So we've got a wide variety of users, including, um, you know, sort of citizen science users and some, I, I guess what you might think of as being non-traditional users because they're the people, um, for example, like EcoCommons or people working on some of those downstream tools who we need to collaborate with in order to, um, actually sort of achieve the value that we want to in terms of the monitoring. Um, and um, what, you know, if you sort of summarise all of this and think about what's actually going on, we end up with a, a lot of users with different needs. Um, and that's those needs that have arise because the, um, the organisations have got different motivations, different culture. It might be sort of scientific. It might be it's more sort of monitoring. They've got different technical skills. Um, and there's a whole bunch of kind of questions that arise from that. But then the thing that makes it, I think, even more tricky is that the whole thing is a moving feast and that the technology and the organisations and the things that the um, uh, organisations want to do are also sort of changing and evolving, as are the personnel within those organisations. And so, you know, we've gone, th you know, in in initially we had a lot of um, um, issues and people wanting help with, you know, particular devices and configurations and hardware and things. And now that's sort of moved on to sort of analysis and, you know, how can you build your own recognizers perhaps to understand the data, uh, moving from sort of single to multiple species. So it really is quite a complex um, complex um, environment to, to work on in a complex community to work um, with, albeit a very, um, a, you know, a very sort of interesting one, and worthwhile one. So I guess, and excuse the sort of selfie uh, they put in the middle here, I guess the sort of key in terms of what we've done is really to work with and to sort of grow the community. So because it's been a young field, we've grown the community. That means actually sort of getting out into the field and working with and helping people to deploy sensors and um, partnering with traditional owners. Um, we've worked, run a number of sort of symposia um, and we've also run a lot of workshops as well. So associated with a lot of the symposia we've run, we've actually sort of run workshops with sort of hands-on session sessions in terms of how to use tools and also to sort of gather and understand um, users' requirements. Um, so um, here's some of our sort of symposia that we've run. In fact, we didn't run the uh, Ecoacoustic Symposia this, way, this year. Um, Karen Rowe and Joe Geddes did down at uh, Melbourne. So we got a bit of a reprieve from the uh, local organisation arrangements this year. 
But I think that's been um, vital to the success that we've had. It's been um, growing and developing this community. And really, I guess the key message, I think, is really realizing that the um, whilst we're a platform project, it's as much about the people as it is about the platform. Um, we've also had a lot of luck with um, working with organizations like Google and also with the sort of ABC. We ran a national um, science week program that generates a lot of good media and publicity, which sort of helps as well. Um, so in terms of sort of lessons and things that we've um, learned, I think, you know, as I said, we've learned that people are certainly as important as the platform that you really need to cultivate and invest in the community. Um, we, I think it's important to have a clear vision about the value that you add and to understand the, the bar for adoption and success for your um, sort of system, your platform of what you're doing. And you need to be agile because things are kind of changing. The other thing which is particularly relevant to the Planet RDC is that the people who are collecting the data, the big data collectors, are not necessarily researchers. So the research, the, the, the data being collected is certainly useful for research, but a lot of the landholders who are collecting the data and are going to collect that those large amounts of data are actually interested in the sort of the monitoring and reporting and being driven by sort of policy rather than being driven by, you know, um, science and wanting to make discoveries and publish. Um, so in terms of, this is my last slide, in terms of sort of what we've done, really I sort of see the project is really about platform and the community. We've got over a thousand users of our platform. We've got over 200 projects, uh, half a petabyte of data, <clears throat> half a, almost half a millennia of data. Um, we focused on supporting users, so being able to kind of catch kind of errors and things to make the ecoacoustics um, um, sort of routine. Um, and I think what that has meant, because we're, um, we've brought people along with us and we're listening to people, it means that we actually get users coming to us, which is, um, which is great. And if you're interested, please um, get in touch. And uh, thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Jenny Fuster. Um, I will get going so we can get to lunch. I'm the director of the Hassan Indigenous RDC at the ARDC and this is Kit Greenhill. Kit is the skills development lead for the Hassan Indigenous RDC. So we're going to do a bit of a double act for you today. Okay, but before I begin I'd like to acknowledge uh, the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the lands that we're on here in Nam, And I respectfully uh, recognise their elders past, present and future. And for all of our Indigenous people around this vast country, so welcome to any Indigenous people with us today and welcome to any Indigenous people with us online. Okay. So we're going to talk about what we've discovered about skills needs in our sector through our co-design workshops and activities in the first half of 2024. We had around 600 registrations across 10 public workshops and we've now got a much better understanding of the digital research skills context for the partnership we develop. The ARDC's partnerships can only address a small proportion of the skills needs we were told about. The Hassan Indigenous RDC's skills focus is on enabling the use of the infrastructure that we are involved in developing. So today we're going to focus on the wider context we discovered in the co-design workshops. Although we found out more than we will use directly, we feel that it's still useful to share what we found out here today. So we're going to outline five things. I'm going to start with what we mean by the Hassan Indigenous Research Data Commons and briefly describe how we reached where we are today. Then I'm going to talk about the co-design process, why and how we did it. Then I'll pass over to Kit and Kit will describe some of the findings from the workshops. So although the co-design activities were not exclusively focused on skills, workshop participants told us a lot about the methods to improve their skills, conditions needed to do this, and who should be involved. 
Um, there are several challenges supporting these skills needs, but Kit will highlight just five of the main ones today, although I'm sure she's open to talking about it more broadly um, at lunch or another opportunity. And finally, I will describe two unique initiatives, three, three unique initiatives we have in the Hassan Indigenous RDC to increase skills capabilities. Our Indigenous Internship Program, the Hassan Indigenous RDC Computational Summer School and um, the Hassan Indigenous RDC Symposium here in June 17th to 19th, free to register. Get on it. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that was that. Right. So now on to the Humanities, Arts, Social Sciences and Indigenous Research Data Commons. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge Indigenous artists... Ooh, Dylan Sara, um, for the Indigenous iconography you'll see there. Um, so at the ARDC, we just define a research data commons as a research as being bringing together people, skills, data, and related resources such as storage, compute, software, and models to enable researchers to conduct world-class data-intensive research. So that's our definition. For me, people and skills are really, really important elements of that definition. The 2016 National Research Infrastructure Roadmap identified opportunities <laughs> to accelerate the impact of Hassan Indigenous research. It recommended improving the overall coordination of research infrastructure that supports access to and analysis of physical and digital collections using tools such as digitisation, aggregation and interpretation platforms. The Australian Government Department of Education subsequently commissioned three studies that identified a number of investment-ready programs that would benefit from national research infrastructure funding. And you can actually download those scoping studies from the ARDC website if you're interested. So while not all recommendations within those studies were funded at this time, activities earmarked to participate in the initial round of development displayed an advanced state of readiness to participate in and benefit from a Hassan Indigenous RDC. And those activities were the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project, which is led by Professor Marcia Langton at University of Melbourne, the Language Data Commons of Australia, led by Professor Michael Hoare at UQ, um, the Integrated Research Infrastructure for Social Sciences, led by Steve Me Pro Associate Professor Steve McEachran at ANU, and a Trove Researcher Platform, which was realised as two distinct but connected pieces of work, the Trove Enhancements Project led by the National Library of Australia and the ARDC Community Data Lab led by the ARDC. In 2023, uh, the ARDC-led Hassan Indigenous RDC received the largest ever investment in Hass research infrastructure in Australia. The $25 million grant from the Australian Government's 2023 National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy funding round, along with co-investment from national partners, will continue to deliver long-term enduring national digital research infrastructure to support Hass and Indigenous researchers in Australia. So we intend to continue our support for the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project the Language Data Commons, the Community Data Lab and Social Sciences, but we're also expanding the RDC to include Australian Creative Histories and Futures and the Australian Internet Observatory. Right. So, co-design process. Um, starting in February this year, the uh, co-design process was used to identify and shape the focus areas for co-investment. And you can read more about the process in this article at uh, Zenodo, which details the process that we went through. As the ARDC is funded through the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, 
the kinds of challenges we seek to address must result in data or research infrastructure be collaboratively realised and national in scope. The strategy also requires strong co-investment from our partners. So we prioritised impact, how many researchers or fields of research can benefit, importance, alignment with national research priorities and step change areas in the ANCRIS roadmap and urgency. Is this a challenge that is time sensitive? For instance, can we do something to address further Indigenous language loss if we act quickly enough? Okay. So five focus areas uh, went under co-design. They were the language, data commons, improving Indigenous research capability, creative arts, mediated data or social and web data, and social sciences. Our ARDC Community Lab and RDC Cross-Cutting Integration stream of work will uh, be got entering into co-design in July. And these workshops that we held were open to all. So, for example, the IIRC, the Improving Indigenous Research Capability Workshop, were attended by a total of 80 participants from 29 organisations, including Australian universities, IATSIS, CSIRO, the GLAM sector, Aboriginal community controlled organisations, research data providers, federal government and peak bodies. Our creative arts workshops were the most popular with over 100 people in attendance. The co-design model we followed is illustrated well here by the UK Design Council's double diamond design model. So we aimed to get as many ideas as possible during the discovery phase before narrowing them down again as we came closer to defining the exact problem. Then within this narrowed focus, we aimed again to get as many points of view in solving that problem before narrowing down a second time to develop the plan for co-investment. Okay, all right. So this, this is another way of looking at that. So we went through the discover, design, develop and deliver phases. So we're, we're heading towards deliver phase now. And they align <laughs> like patting your stomach and, you know, <laughs> it's like, oh. <laughs> um, okay, so the discover, design, develop and deliver phases align to our problem, problem identification, project shaping, project planning and plan endorsement phases. So in workshop one, we concentrated on problem identification and a little on project shaping. Nope, wrong one. Okay, we concentrated on understanding the problem, uh, the problems researchers experience and what we could achieve to address those problems. We did a lot of blue sky thinking together and we recorded all suggestions that were made because they can help to shape our thinking for program expansion in the future. They also help us to inform the Department of Education on where there are capability gaps in the sector. In workshop two, we concentrated mostly on project shaping and commenced thinking about project planning. So we started to think through how to address the problems and challenges researchers told us they were experiencing. What research infrastructure solutions could we collaboratively build that could benefit the national research community? Who would need to be involved and how would we know when we had been successful? And now I'm going to hand over to Kit so she can have the fun with the... Oh, with the clicker <laughs> and the looking and the everything else. I've got a timer here as well. Okay. So what I want to talk about is what we found out about the skills needs through all that process. So what we ended up is, we ended up with 3,000 data points. And that's a lot, <laughs> okay? And they weren't all about skills. 
And to give you an example, this is what um, at the language, the Eldaka workshop too, this is what the Muro board looked like just for the section where we were asking about skills. So what we had is we had six Zoom breakout rooms. People were putting these things up left, right and centre. People were talking. So part of what we were doing was actually listening as part of that process as well as having meetings. Thankfully, Miro lets you download as long as it's like the um, posts that go more or less within the line, you get them downloaded in um, uh, columns. So that's kind of useful. But nonetheless, we ended up with asking uh, Nicola, who was running the process, she ended up codifying all submissions. But what she did is just codified them a single code. So she, it was different for each focus area, but it included things like increasing technical skills, skills and training, increased capability. So what I was able to do was, they were the flags that I started with, but I also looked across all the data points to have a look at what was being said about, I've got a, I've got the lake lapel on. Is it not working? Okay, sorry. Is the lapel... How about that? Is that better for the people online? Can they hear? Yeah? Cool. Thank you. Okay. So what we ended up getting was mostly feedback about how, who, and the conditions for skills uplift. But of course, people didn't package them like that. It was more like things like this. So we'd have a quote like this from the... Uh, Improving Indigenous work Workshop Capability, the first workshop. Culturally appropriate online open resources, for example, how-to videos, social media posts, web pages, by and for Indigenous people involved in recording, collecting, using and sharing digital information. These resources must be done by Indigenous people with the support of technologists, but not led by non-Indigenous technologists. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack just in that one data point, okay? So we've got the how. Online resources, how to videos, social media posts, and web pages. We've got a who, by and for an Indigenous people involved in a particular process. We've got the we that needs to be culturally appropriate, it needs to be open. The resources must be done in a particular way. Okay, so we've got a lot of information that we've been playing with there. So, most of the skills feedback how is the preferred methods of delivery? We found out a lot about that. The who, is what, who needs skills and who should be supporting that acquisition, and the with is the necessary conditions. Okay, so I'm going to start with the who, but before that, the what, which is the topics and what we should actually be looking at in um, training and uplift. There wasn't that much about it because until we've done that narrowing down at the end to know what the projects are, we don't know exactly what it was. But there were a lot of basics that were coming out nonetheless, and the intermediate and advanced we'll be working with later with the projects, but we had a lot of the basics, so I'll talk a bit about that at the end. So the hows, again, I'll start with a quote from the second Indigenous, um, Improving Indigenous um, Research Capability Workshop. Fit for purpose cookbooks and how-to guides. It should be as easy to catalogue and share correctly to tagged Indigenous data as to make damper. Okay, so that's our remit. Interesting. Okay, so I divided up the hows into a number of general categories. What I found interesting is if I was to do a bar graph, there's not going to be one that's standing out. People mentioned all of these as frequently as each other. So you've got how-to guides in do-it-yourself resources, frequently asked questions and help pages, self-help knowledge bases, frameworks, guidelines and policies, online guides in all in a single place like LibGuides and lists of definitions of terms. So this is, as far as possible when I'm sharing this with you, I'm trying to use their words. Within those do-it-yourself resources or even in other ways, people wanted examples. They wanted exemplars, case studies, pre-written code in notebooks, what they called cookbooks, workflows, somebody said examples, 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 and checklists. Okay, so another way that they were really interested in getting their skills up left. Doing and making, actually doing things hands on. So data sprints, summer and winter schools, hackathons, gamified activities, I don't know what they mean but it sounds really interesting. Um, <laughs> workshops at conferences, workshops at events which are not obviously core or audiences. So, so doing stuff. It was also very, very clear that they don't want to be done to. So peer-to-peer -peer was very important. So they mentioned round tables, they mentioned peer-led teaching, carpentry-style events, which 
the plug for tomorrow, okay? <laughs> um, student internships, mentoring for HDRs, and people talked about snowball training, okay? So you go out to community, you train somebody who goes out to the next community who trains people, and it just goes on from there. So very much don't give to, be part of. Okay, face to face, um, with some of the Indigenous communities, they said, we want to learn on country, so we want face to face. Some said face to face sessions and office hours, but likewise, they wanted remote as well so they could stay on country. So people said, we want remote learning so that we can do it from country. They mentioned webinars, short movies, open in interactive textbooks. And I'm really stressing here that there weren't, they didn't say we want webinars and workshops, which kind of when we think of skills is kind of what we think of doing with people. But it wasn't clear that that was the n number one. Okay. This I found interesting. Most of the people were from the university sector and they talked about formal education. They wanted micro courses and micro credentials. They said, we want to incorporate this kind of knowledge, our knowledge, how to use our infrastructure within PhD education courses. Um, integration into undergraduate and postgrad, high school, new university degrees in subjects like Indigenous data sovereignty and basic vet courses. So that was kind of something that I was really interesting, interested in who they thought, one, ought to be doing it, but also the idea that people in VET courses, people in high school are potential researchers who are going to be using data in the future. Okay, so from that, my conclusions around the how are researchers are aware of many modalities. We need to actually ask preferences. It's really important that we facilitate peer learning. If doing synchronous training, consider also providing a DIY resource with lots of examples. And if producing a DIY resource, likewise, think about doing synchronous training to match, maybe have a launch or something like that. And formal education may have a coursework role to support the digital skills of potential researchers. Interesting, okay, I'm gonna go on to the who. Again, starting with a quote from the creative workshop, the second creative workshop, who does this well? Look outside the sector, include STEM and what STEM could stand to gain from the creative arts. And I promise that I didn't change these slides from the leadership forum yesterday, but a lot of what I have happens in the next few slides is stuff you've seen yesterday, which is really interesting. Okay, so the learners, researchers at different career levels. University administration, I thought it was interesting that they said ethics committees, if we're gonna have decent research, reusable research data that people understand how to reuse. Ethics committees who are approving projects need to know that. University research officers, e-research units. Students, PhD, undergraduate and high school students, as I said before. They talked about the different levels, okay? People are in different parts of the life cycle, so actually having training aimed at curators, trained at custodians, trained at users, narrowing and segmenting. Also, People at different levels of understanding, recognising some people actually need advanced, while some people need a basic, understand who your audience is. This group of people were very concerned about diversity of learners as well. Understanding that people are multilingual, lingual, there's people with disabilities, people have diverse cultural backgrounds, and some people may not have internet access, which kind of I needed reminding. So yeah, it was useful. Um, among the Indigenous respondents, um, they were very clear, this was sort of, this is a summary of a number of points, communities where the data originates by and for. Okay, prescribed body corporates and local Aboriginal land councils, health workers, educators and community support workers. Okay, so with the trainers, again, this is another demand where the people who are going to be communicating about how to do research data using research data, doing things with data. It's a collaborative effort. So this is in the second um, Indigenous, uh, Improving Indigenous Research Capability Workshop, a summit of community workers. First up, collect ideas of what does and does not work. Perhaps consult education experts who work in communities for the best learning design methods. Indigenous teachers, learning designers and teaching assistants. Okay, so it's really complex, this entire area of helping people to use our infrastructure. So with the trainers, these were just some of the unusual ones that I saw. 
So libraries and councils in, in regional areas looking at using libraries and councils to be delivering the training. Communities where the data originates, by and for, bridging people. Now, this was on the stage yesterday. There was a lot of talk about those people who know tech, who know research, and are doing jobs in that area, the need for those people to be involved. And I thought this was interesting. With um, any products that you're using, get research colleagues, not vendors, to do the training. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So basically, my summary of the WHO is researchers aren't the only people who need digital skills training if more data-informed research is to happen in Australia, and we need to look really widely. OK, the right conditions. Again, from this um, mediated DARPA workshop too, it's important to link this outreach with training, connect with disciplinary associations, summer schools, etc., so it's more integrated with scholarly culture and not seen as infrastructure. There's a lot going on in that quote, and I'm sort of pulling little bits of meaning out from a lot of quotes to sort of get these points that I've summarised around. First is relationships, okay? Really, really important that we build relationships so the right people connect and mentor each other. It's important that we have communities of practice. Online forums to allow communications. Let's let the users talk to each other. Um, better collaboration between the tool makers and the researchers and national communities of trainers, which I thought was kind of nice. OK. Also important as a prerequisite a condition for skills uplift is community control. OK. The quote you saw before, the support by technologists but indigenous communities to determine what that is, but also forums to find out from researchers what training they want. Good idea. OK. I found this one... <laughs> You know, if, if you've sort of been in skills training for a while, you've probably seen this, these kinds of quotes, which is, OK, let's look at the tools that we're trying to get people using. So maybe if we had easier to use interfaces, and then we wouldn't need training and guide. So actually, let's look at the interfaces. But let's also be allowed, allow people to download data set and to play with the tools in their own space, but also to create sandboxes so that people are very, very comfortable that they're not going to break stuff and they can actually use, use things. So actually saying this is your play space. Another precondition for really good skills uplift was clarification, defining the target audiences. The um, Indigenous people were talking about information sessions with elders to explain what training is and the benefit to community and identifying who is responsible for training which people. Another important thing, ethics. Ethical frameworks to guide any training. Any training needs to be informed by cultural protocols. And for working with Indigenous people, we were reminded about respect, relevance, reciprocity and responsibility as being those principles when working with Indigenous communities doing any research. And again, another one that, you know, Surprise, surprise, these are people working in universities, but they had a lot to say about university systems, OK? The need to value, value training as a scholarly activity. The need for, if people do have decent um, data literacy, for that to be included in promotion when you're actually looking at rewards for people who are working in the academy. If researchers don't have those basic skills, whose responsibility is it? to make sure that happens. What's the university role in that? And the idea of sharing materials between universities. OK. The last way that um, there were conditions for improving the um, digital skills was around fitting the learning journey. So somebody said, well, let's develop it early. Don't make it a, a, a um, bolt on afterwards. Develop it early so it doesn't happen as an afterthought. What about getting a formal map of all the training available to researchers so we actually know what's out there? Resources that can be updated and consulted long term don't create something just for um, one session without considering can it actually be used much longer. Remuneration for those being trained. Jobs at the end for people who undertake training. And as you saw yesterday at the leadership um, symposium, the leadership um, Panel, research, software, management, career paths, retention is a really big issue for postdocs. So, sort of, this quote in some ways sort of sums up um, that whole learning journey thing is there's a need to embed training and capacity building into other training. Community are overloaded with training, 
so much of which leads nowhere to qualifications, to jobs, etc. So don't add extra burden of training when it can be embedded in existing frameworks. For example, land and sea country management activities. Okay, so that was interesting. We're tra a trained out population. Think about that. Okay, so from those preconditions, I sort of boiled that down to skills are improved in an interconnected system of community relationships and ethics. You need to be considering that if you're doing any skills uplift. And the second thing is what looks like a skills deficit may need other things to change, not throwing more training at it. So you might need to simplify your tools. You might need to clarify your needs and you might need to change how skills are valued so more people are actually going to do that. Okay, very quickly about the what. The what, as I said, it's going to be determined at an advanced and intermediate level, project by project, but across those workshops, people wanted to know about Indigenous data governance, knowledge of each other's techniques and tools to collaborate, which we were also seeing people talking about on the stage, that cross-pollination. Data collection, data ethics, consent, permissions and licensing training, digital literacy, collecting, using and sharing data, text analytic, application of metadata and fair and care. So these were the things that across, didn't matter what workshop, they were coming up again and again. Okay, so from all that, just five challenges. As Jenny said, there's probably more. Okay, so the first is that consultation is essential, but it's resource intensive and not just for us. If you go out to a community and say, we're going to do a one week workshop about what type of training you need and they end up with, we want half an hour training, that's kind of a waste of time, but there needs to be consultation. How do you actually do effective consultation that isn't going to waste the time of people who could be actually gaining skills by training if you weren't busy consulting, but how do you do it in a respectful, collaborative way? And I think that ethics and relationships that I talked about before is kind of the key to that. How to support so many suggested delivery types, okay? My next way of thinking and my next lot of conversations I want to have with um, the projects for the Research Data Commons um, is the preferred delivery types. What do they like, okay? There's a whole lot. Do they want a whole lot of all, everything? Should we be doing a different one each month and seeing who turns up and um, working out what, what prefers? Or should we just be focusing on some targets because we can't do everything? Okay, of those six projects that we're contracting out, do they each need an, their own skills framework because they're going to have unique topics and users? Or can we adapt existing data and digital skills research frameworks for what we're doing? Fourth is for us, um, humanities and social sciences methods are often qualitative, but a lot of the material out there is about quantitative research. Now, that's not just finding the resources, that's explaining to people who might be useful in using our infrastructure, our digital infrastructure, that actually it relates to their qualitative research very, very nicely, okay? The idea is that no, that's not actually relevant to my meaning making with people. The last one is that role of universities when university, when researchers don't have basic digital skills because we're not going to be a basic, we're not going to be spending a lot of time making sure people understand what an API is and what it stands for but if they don't have that, who's going to fill that gap so that we can actually do that? Now I'm going to hand over to Jenny to talk about three strategies we're looking at. We're nearly there, nearly at lunch, <laughs> guys, nearly at lunch. Okay. Hello. Oh, can you unlock that for me? I've got notes. Come. <laughs> okay. Oh, actually, I can read them right there. Okay, so um, this is Liam Jensen, everyone. Uh, Liam is our Indigenous intern. He's the, he's the second Indigenous intern that we've had, so this is a program that's now in its second year. And uh, we see the internship as uh, uplifting digital skills for young Indigenous people interested in working in research infrastructure sector. It's been a vital component of our program to uplift these skills uh, and create uh, research tools and platforms uh, in conjunction with our intern. So Liam's really interested in data analytics and um, that's the area that he likes to work in. He's doing some work for the Language Data Commons 
but he's also working with the Improving Indigenous Research Capabilities Project. And indeed, the internship is based with uh, Professor Langton's team at University of Melbourne uh, to provide cultural safety to our, our intern. Our previous intern, Lisa Rigney, had a background in education and uh, she has gone back to and was indeed very involved in uh, our summer school, which I'll talk about in a moment. Uh, and she's gone back to the education field at the end of her internship. But we're also really proud of Lisa because she was recently elected to the South Australian Voice to Parliament. So, you know, I think it's a program that has benefit not only for the ARDC, but of more importantly for the intern as well. Um, and then we have, this is another one of our skills areas. We have the annual uh, Hassan Indigenous RDC Computational Skills Summer School. So we've been running that now for two years and it's becoming an annual event that we hold in February. Um, it's free. We run a number of bursaries to enable uh, people who may not have the financial means to attend to come along. And we really target their uh, HDRs and uh, postgrads, HDRs uh, postgrads <laughs> and ECRs, um, as well as Indigenous data custodians. Is there anything else you want to say about that? No? And I mentioned our third initiative is our Hassan Indigenous RDC Symposium, which again, it's this is the second time we will have run that in June 17th, uh, 18th and 19th here. Register online, everyone. Um, it's actually hybrid, so if you want to just dip into some of the sessions, you can do that online um, or we'd love to have you come along in person. And that's really to inform people higher up in the university sector of what we're doing I across the Hassan Indigenous RDC. So looking at uh, deans and that kind of level, uh, but also interested researchers to come along, hear about what we're doing, uh, talk to the project leads, discover what, what the research infrastructure is that we're developing. Um, have those conversations and uh, to encourage people actually getting involved and using the research infrastructure. Is that us? That's us. That's us. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. I realise that we've run well into the lunch break now. Yeah, and I'm going to run in even further. So I'm going to be the enemy here. Okay. <laughs> so handing back to Catherine. Okay, um, really quite aware that you've been spoken to and at for quite a long time and um, really also uh, listening to all of those talks, aware of the wicked problem that, um, you know, the skill space has in terms of ensuring that users of research infrastructure are actually um, trained appropriately or skilled, upskilled appropriately. Okay, um, right, so we've um, heard from all the projects, they've provided a brief overview of their um, infrastructure and the services and platforms and tools that they're offering uh, to their users or could potentially, um, or, or could offer to potential users because they, there's still users out there that they need to capture. Um, and they've identified the research and other communities uh, their research infrastructure aims to benefit and have outlined some of the challenges with regards to engaging, building and upskilling their um, user communities. This session is about tapping into the collective expertise in the room and online. Um, so I need you all to put your consultants hats on. But before we do that, um, we've got a four. We've got four lightning talks, and um, I would these these are actually you know sort of looking at um, sharing real world examples of successful user engagement, particularly through training and skills uplift programs. 
um, and initiatives implemented for different research communities as well. So our first speaker, and hopefully she's online and ready to go, um, is Anne Backhouse. And so Anne is the Education and Training Manager at Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. Um, Anne is it, uh, she seeks to accelerate researchers' discoveries through the Pawsey User Training Program. In addition, Anne helps build Australia's next generation of scientists through the internship program, summer schools and STEM outreach, underpinned with an extensive network of partners. Anne also keeps Pawsey staff upskilled in current and future looking technologies, as well as essential skills which contribute to Pawsey's friendly vibe. So over to Anne. Thank you, thank you, Catherine. Um, I'd also, before I start, like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I'm dialing in from, and that's the Wajak Noongar people, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. For context, PAUSI is a Tier 1 High Performance Computing, or HPC, facility in Perth. It's an unincorporated joint venture of CSIRO, Curtin University, Murdoch University, the University of Western Australia. We provide meritorious access to supercomputing to Australian researchers. I started with Posi about five and a half years ago. We were procuring a new supercomputer. Woo, there it is. You see it? Yes. Okay, we're on slide two, thanks. There we are. Um, I started with Posi five and a half years ago. We were procuring a new supercomputer to be operational within two years. We developed change in training plans to move our 4,000 plus users onto the new technology. Then COVID hit, and as we all know, everything changed. Next slide, thanks. Fast forward to today. Life has normalized, and we should be back to business as usual. Are we? Enter, thanks. All right, press enter, thanks. There you go. I'd suggest we are not back to, to business as usual. It may not be for a while. The fields of supercomputing, quantum computing, machine learning, and AI are changing the technology landscape with increasing speed and intensity. Change, thanks. Take machine learning as an example. It's a key driver of computational demand. In the open AI area, computational demand doubles every 3.4 months. That's not business as usual. Next slide, thanks. Where does this leave the users of current and emerging infrastructures? Those we need to train? They're confused and annoyed. They want to do their research. They want to learn just enough technology coding or whatever to do that. This isn't enough. Many of the new technologies and infrastructures require more than superficial knowledge. Next slide, thanks. Posse's education and training team is seeking to address this changing infrastructure landscape through a framework called the Posse Academy. This is both new and not new. That is, we're putting a framework on what we already do today. We've organized the academy into four streams from left to right. And sorry, it looks like it's kind of got the, the spacing funny, but never mind. You'll see the slides later. It begins with education outreach, mostly to secondary students and teachers, then moves into Grow at Posi, which targets tertiary students and postgrads. The last two streams, Start at Posi and Scale at Posi target researchers and users, both new and experienced. While this shows a progression from left to right, a learner can start from wherever they're at. For example, an early career researcher is supported by Start at Posi. An experienced HPC user wanting to optimize their code, say, would fall into the Scale at Posi framework. In a nutshell, what the Academy does is organizes into a framework who is learning, what do they need to know, when do they need to know it, and how can they best learn it and apply it. This helps us to organize and sequence our many videos, workshops, and trainings 
that we offer and it gives learners a framework for upskilling. Please note that this is in draft and we're socializing at the moment. Next slide, thanks. While we don't have time to do a deep dive into each stream, let's more, look more closely at the early career researcher example from the previous slide and highlighted here in yellow. Our objective for this researcher is to provide an on-ramp to the infrastructure through the building of core skills. We offer a combination of teaching modalities and approaches. Let's take, for instance, a course we call Using Supercomputers. We've offered this for many years. It's a core training lasting about seven hours, and it's like a fire hose of information, especially for a new user. We're revamping that course right now to separate the core supercomputing concepts out of the workshop. Concepts will be presented in a series of short informational videos so new learners can view them when and where they want. They can then come to a workshop where they'll practice the hands-on aspects of supercomputing, such as logging onto Satonix. During the workshop, there's a consolidation of concept and practice. Final slide. We're out of time, but I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you and thank you for your patience and flexibility. So, Georgia Mori, Dr. Georgia Mori is data science trainer at the Sydney Informatics Hub at University of Sydney. Um, Georgia is a data scientist with a background in microbiology and bioinformatics. She is a software data and library carpentry instructor and she has been supervising teaching and training students in the development of com computational skills for conducting efficient and reproducible research. She volunteers in diversity initiatives such as the uh, ladies, um, pie ladies, uh, to support the representation of gender minorities in the programming community. So over to you, Georgia. Thank you. Um, I don't have fancy slides to share with you today. I will just talk a little bit about um, what we do at the Sydney Informatics Hub. We are a um, core research facility at the University of Sydney and we support researchers with their data-related uh, research projects. We are a team of about 20 people. We are data scientists, statisticians, bioinformaticians, software engineers, and so we help researchers um, from different fields. We help them uh, in many different ways. Uh, we provide them with um, research computing platforms. We support them through short consults, or we also do offer long-term support for their research projects. And, um, and we run training for them. Um, the kind of training that we run um, is very different. We run some training that is uh, software agnostic, and this is very specific for the statistical training that we offer. And we also have hands-on training, um, such as um, exploratory data analysis or machine learning using R or using Python. And we do offer online training, what we call master classes. These are 60-minute um, webinar. Uh, it's fully online, we do record the session, and we use our YouTube channel to make the training session available for, any, for everyone to look at. And when we run in-person training, we build a um, website with uh, all the material that we've developed for the, train for the attendees so that they can have a look at it uh, once the training session is finished and you know, at their own time, at their own pace. So we really try and do our best to make the training accessible mm -hmm. and inclusive. And you know, we think we, we, we do quite a good job and then you know, you're online and you, have, you can't see any face, uh, breakout room, complete silence, and, um, or maybe you're hybrid, you have you know, online, it's not really working well, you were, you're hoping that people in person would engage and, but you know, maybe you have 10 people in the room, 10 table, and you have one person sitting in each table. <laughs> and it's, so you, you, we say, we talk about engagement a lot, and we, we think that um, making training accessible, inclusive, and giving the, 
avail the time, the availability, the material is enough for actually engaging and having some learning happening. But I, in my experience, my short experience, because I've been a trainer just in, in this past half, one and a half years, I see that that's not enough. Um, you know, I got this job because of my technical skills and we, we always talk about technical skills and what we know, um, but often I find that it's, it's actually about I'm how much I don't know that makes the difference when it comes to engaging with the researchers. Um, you know, it's we talked about soft skills as well yesterday. So, um, and our main aim at the Cine Informatics Hub is that of empowering researchers, making them able to work on the research project, do their own data analysis. And the way that we can actually do that is not only through transfer of knowledge, but is also about you know communication and um, being empathetic and um, make them feel safe so that they don't feel like they can't ask a question because maybe that's a silly question and they shouldn't even be asking it. And kind of breaking that invisible wall that we have between us and them because there is always this thing we are separate from them and they think that we know all of these things and they don't really know if we can help them and so there's this break in communication that's happening. So it's a lot of work, I think. Um, going to training for me is, is not really about what I know. I do use my technical skills for developing the content, but then it's a lot of about the human interaction, my soft skills uh, to actually engage with them. And when this happens, uh, it's actually amazing because you know we send that uh, post-training survey feedback and we do get amazing feedback but um, what we see is that you know people in the class maybe we are able to take a group photo or they chat together they sit all together and suddenly we you know there is a lot of noise and no one is just looking at their laptop um, but you know also what we like a lot is when they actually take the time to send us an email tell tell us that they've actually used what we have to we're trying to teach them in their own research project and they're very thankful for that um, yeah and I think that's my minute five minutes <laughs> This will be interesting. Do we want to try Anne again online and see? Let me share screen two. And how's my screen? Did yes, that... we can see it. Perfect. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Patrick, um, as introduced before, AWS Cloud Application Specialist. Um, and I've put this together with uh, our partners, Ash who's a solutions architect at AWS. And I want to talk a little bit about our collaboration um, and how we've gone about uh, empowering our researchers as or you know, doing our best. Our, our main vision is to empower research and teaching excellence through cutting edge cloud infrastructure. And without reading our mission, the main keywords are training to maximize the scientific return. So from this, you can see that we, we you know, the race hub which is the RMIT AWS Cloud Supercomputing Hub, really has this major focus on training and upskilling, um, not only just providing infrastructure and, and you know, cloud um, access. The race landscape, um, in very brief, um, covers a wide range of services um, and, and platforms for the researchers here at RMIT, uh, from basic compute and storage um, through to HPC, um, ALML, AIML, quantum computing, um, all the way through to um, native access to AWS. So um, we sort of get a wide spectrum of complexities and, and researcher use cases. We recently hit 500 users. Um, and these come from all areas of RMIT, not just those from computer science. So as you might expect, the cloud is a very new space for a lot of people and a lot of our researchers we work with. Um, coming from all skill levels, um, from you know app development teams to cloud engineers to undergrads, students. 
So there's two main focuses um, that we have, which is how to use our platform efficiently, but then also um, advance in emerging technologies. Um, and so this is where the partnership between race and AWS comes in. So we look to um, via offering training workshops, um, and I'll touch more of that on just a moment, but also um, consulting with the teams on best practices. Um, and we can also lean on our network of experts that we've been working through. And again, I'll, I'll touch on that just in a moment. Um, but through all of this, we also get to identify what skills are missing and actually go and build training workshops, training sessions to, to fill those gaps. Um, and the final one is just expert service, um, what we like to call, and that's where we actually get hands-on with the team um, and actually try and help create, build, deploy, you know, help them get through their, their research. So coming back to the training we offer, we found success by um, on the platform by making sure that um, we have an embedded onboarding training. So anyone who comes and accesses our platform, there is a, a short onboarding session that allows them to sort of accelerate their, their chances of, of success. Um, as I mentioned, we run tailored workshops. So working with academics in AWS to offer those domain specific workshops, technical consultation, I mentioned that before, um, hands-on workshops. So we ensure that um, after the end of any of our workshops, the users and our researchers can really take it away and, and use it for their own research. Um, and I mentioned building a network of experts, but what I mean more specifically is as we work with more research teams, academics, students, AWS, we're building up this network of um, you know, experts in these areas on you know, Gen AI, quantum, HPC optimization that we can really scale beyond the size of our own team. So this is an opportunity to sort of collaborate with other research teams to, to sort of you know, lift everyone up together. Um, and a bit of a bit of a quick overview of this kind of training we're talking about. The platform training, like I mentioned, bringing our users on board and giving them a chance to um, uh, get a bit of guidance on how we run everything. Then we have the research domain deep dives. This is where we partner with AWS to provide those very specific training. Maybe it could be, like I said, quantum, HPC, Gen AI is the big topic at the moment, building your own chatbots. But also um, my last point is coursework. So we try and get in early before um, researchers have um, you know, graduated and, and moved on and come to RMIT because we want to make sure that this experience or this, this understanding of what race looks like at RMIT is, is sort of given to them at an early stage. So we get in some guest speakers, um, also run workshops and whatnot. Um, and on that, we do, I talk about deep dives because we don't, run training sessions on intro to Python or intro to R, while they're useful, we really are trying to focus our time and effort into this emerging and um, advanced technology. So that's the Gen AI, quantum, genetic experiment, HPC, coding efficiency tools. Um, and then the final thing I just wanted to touch on was some of the recent events we've, we've sort of run. So we ran Deep Racer. Oh, out of time there. Uh, Deep Racer, uh, building Gen AI chatbots, uh, genomics pipelines, uh, machine, uh, a no-code approach to machine learning. Um, and, you know, we had a deep dive where we had a guest speaker from AWS to talk all about uh, the serverless framework. Um, so that's a little bit about what we've been doing recently. Um, so far this year, we've had over 150 attendees to our training sessions, um, and we're looking to, to continue that through the rest of the year. Um, if anyone would like to talk anymore, there's our contact details, and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay. And now just to sort of expand it a little bit beyond um, sort of institutional, I guess, type uh, training um, or, you know, a single organisation type training, we're looking at um, a more global perspective here. So we have Liz um, Stokes, who is our skills development lead for um, skills trainers and research communities. And so uh, she's going to come up and just give a little bit of a spiel on um, carpentries, which she's very, very embedded in. Uh, all right. Can you hear me okay? Someone tell me if the people online can hear me too. Oh, yep. Great. Um, well, I guess I can... Um, so the carpentries... For those of you who are unfamiliar with this, and look, I'm not very good at carpentry myself, actually, but I love love working with wood. That's great. 
but uh, it's a the thecarpentries.org is a um, a program to teach researchers um, who don't have any experience in programming uh, those basics um, those basic pro basics of programming so that they can access <coughs> infrastructure like um, like the kind that we purport to support um, and, and build. Uh, they've been around for about 25 years. We had a big um, 25th and a celebration last year when um, a, a couple of people realised that researchers are not getting access typically throughout their discipline degrees uh, any ex experience in learning how to code and, and to, to program. So it typically teaches um, uh, for researchers the world over um, through a short half day to two day workshops which allow, um, and through a particularly hands on and participatory way, um, allowing le learners to develop the confidence to continue on in their own um, outside the workshop. And the Carpentries have um, specifically trained instructors who, to come back to your comment um, about andragogy and different modes of learning, um, we train our instructors in evidence-based uh, best practice research in pedagogy and I guess it includes some kind of andragogical concept uh, to engage learners especially in an area of expertise which they are novices and I think as we all know that even in those areas around fair data capabilities, around data management and some of those basic um, programming skills, these are not typical things that come, come through uh, naturally to researchers. That may be completely different in the future. We may have some of um, the, the impact of Pawsey's um, school-based um, running can, might bring us uh, researchers who don't need to engage in a carpentry-style workshop. So while it's not for everything, I would like to suggest that some of our instructor training that we run is somewhere that enables our researchers and research supporting communities the ability to cross some of those expert awareness gaps that we have and allow us to communicate with each other. Because I think if we take it back to the basic foundations of universities, universities are places where you go to learn <laughs> about, about things. And that business of communicating knowledge is something that universities specialise in. So I guess what we are trying to do is do something like that for the, the new infrastructure that we're building. I'm going to wrap up with a nod towards the community building aspect um, because I think that probably, I, th I think it's an important um, thing that we forget when we try to develop training at scale to reach as many people as possible. We imagine all of those learners as individuals and by forgetting that they're part of communities means that we're not, we're not providing them with the scaffolding that they would need uh, to confidently maintain those skills. So what I like particularly about the Carpentries uh, is how they encourage the support for their instructors to debrief and prepare for their upcoming workshops and how we leverage, um, uh, we leverage openly licensed training materials and we use GitHub to maintain and continuously improve those curriculum that we develop. There are also specific roles around the maintenance of those lessons and the program governance committees. And um, tomorrow at our Carpentry Connect event, we'll be talking about how the Software Carpentry Governance Committee uh, are looking to redevelop some of their um, lessons around Git. So I guess, yeah, that, 
that's pretty much it from from me. So, like coming back to um, a comment about different learnings and our abilities, I would really like to emphasise the importance of it's it's not only it's not the individual. I think we put a lot of this into our ability to service an individual researcher, and the more that we can enable people to communicate better with each other, with the degree of skill that uh, a trainer has, I think the better off we, we are for supporting those, um, that the skills to be applied. Thank you. Uh, we've got a quick message from Juliana <laughs> about ResBuzz. So quickly find your seats and I'll pass over to Juliana. Hey, thank you everyone and welcome back. Um, I just quickly want to um, reiterate Slava's comment earlier this morning. ResBuzz is coming back to Victoria, yay. Um, so save the date for um, 26, 27 and 28th of November. Um, Monash Clayton Campus, the EU Research Center, center rather, will be hosting ResBuzz. Um, we will be sending out lots of comms when we ha once we have the program ready. But if you have questions, suggestions, please email us. And thank you. Thank you, Juliana. That's very exciting news. I've been involved in a few ResBuzzes in the past, so I'll be excited, looking forward to that. Uh, so for our next activity, we're going to be jumping online. <laughs> um, so we've got a Mentimeter. There's a QR code there. Uh, let me see if I can close all of this. Um, I don't know if anyone can smell that in the air. It smells like money. <laughs> uh, all right, so lucky me. This might be sarcasm, but I've just come across a large amount of money. <laughs> and I'd like to share it with all of you for your budding ideas. So jump onto Mentimeter. Uh, we've got a, if you go to www.menti.com and enter the code 57895855, or you can scan the QR code. I'll keep those open at this on the screen as well. Um, there's also a fun uh, thumbs up button that'll appear on your screen <laughs> as we go along. All right. So, your research project budget is now unlimited. Start thinking, how would you spend that money? So, we've got a question here for you to answer. And I'll pass over to Amani to read that question out. And you can start inputting your responses. Yes. So, the code is in the bottom left corner. Or you can use that number up the top as well. Yep, so the QR code's over there, and if you look right up the top there, so 57895855 is the number. That's a little hard for me to read without my glasses, but I can manage. Yeah, oh, there it is. <laughs> so, um, as Marian mentioned, um, it's raining money, um, and so we asked, and coming off the last um, activity as well, um, this should be really fun to answer. Um, what engagement, community building and training activities would you propose for digital research infrastructure staff and users? So users including researchers. So have a think about if you had unlimited resources, what activities would you use to ups, um, would you propose for digital research infrastructure staff and users? And um, what we'll do now, so have a think about what we were talking about last time as well, like, you know, you can invest in things like, you know, external Oh, we've got a few here already. Cool. Yep, early career researchers. Cool, so we'll give you guys about, what, five, ten minutes? Yep. And then after um, we've um, done that, we can vote on um, the best ones and then we can discuss. Mm. So we'll move on from there. We'll give you guys about five so minutes. If you've already submitted an answer, you can submit another one if you would like. Uh, you can also have a read through some of the answers that have already been submitted 
and think about which one you'd like to upvote. You'll have a few, maybe three uh, prompts that you can upvote, and we'll give you some separate time for that after this. So for now, read through what's already been submitted, and I can see that there are 52 responses already. Uh, and that'll be multiple responses from some people as well. I can't see digital literacy group therapy up there, so. <laughs> <laughs> cool. They're in the microphone. Oh, cool. Yeah, as I was saying, I can't see digital literacy group therapy up there. That'd be great. Let's go for me here. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Develop a mascot. We do need more mascots. Data man. <laughs> yes. Acronym man. <laughs> Into business training program. More tropical island training retreat. That sounds <laughs> unbelievable. That was so good. And yeah, I will upvote that. And hey, we got a lot of money, so. <laughs> <laughs> Rate training framework. Yes, frameworks. Establish COPs. Q and A's. Hmm. How long has it been going on? It's gone on soon, like four minutes, and we've already got how many responses now? So we have eighty-seven um, responses. Awesome. Keep going. <laughs> Who has, by show of hands, submitted a response? Who would like more time? A couple people. Okay. So, I'm going to give you, I'm going to start a timer for one minute. Yeah, perfect. You've got one minute left. And then we'll switch to voting for responses as well. So again, if you've already made submissions, you can have a look at what's already there. We've jumped up to 98 responses now. <laughs> yes, can we break 100? And lots of thumbs up <laughs> going. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're nearly there. Uh, we found that the thumbs up button is a different color for every person. Mm. So oh. what is your color? He broke 100. We're on 105 now. <laughs> Three, two, one. All right. Time to vote for your favorite. And someone got in at the very last second there. 112 responses. <laughs> well done. Um, all right. Time to vote for your favorite. Uh, now you can vote up to three times. You can only vote once if you prefer. So we'll give you a little bit of time to look through all of those responses, find the one that you're passionate about. If you're having any trouble with your Mentimeter, refresh the page and you should be able to see everything again. But your thumbs up button might change color. <laughs> Or upside. Is everyone signing up for one? Oh, 112 responses to get through. So, is it 112? Yes. So, 112 responses to get through. Choose one to vote for. After three. 
If you like more than one, you can vote for up to three. I can see a lot of heads are still down scrolling through all of those responses, so we'll give you a bit more time. Once you've finished voting, hit that thumbs up button so that we can see that you've finished voting. <laughs> it looks like a lot of people have finished voting all at once. Who would like more time to vote? Okay, I'll give you another countdown timer. Oh, it's not. Yeah, I'll come and have a look. We'll come and have a look. Um, all right. 30 seconds left. Yes, so you have a maximum of three votes to submit. Okay, so the submit button is grey. If you're having trouble reading it, you might need to increase your screen brightness. Oh, it's not allowing you su to submit. Oh, okay, I can see that people are voting now. I'm going to add some extra... People have just started submitting. Ten people have voted. <laughs> if you're having any trouble, please refresh the website. Okay, now we're getting lots of votes coming in. Are they coming in now? Yes. But refreshing works? I'm not sure. It's been like a day. So yeah. well, I think it's coming in now. All right. Who has managed to submit their votes? I can see that more than 60% of the people who've joined have voted, which is a good sign. Creeping up to 80% now. All right, I'll give you five more seconds to get them in if you haven't yet. Five, four, three, two, and one. Let's see the results. Okay, so our most popular, most voted for was people, people, people. Makes a lot of sense to me. I was expecting some comments like that. Um, hire the best, pay them the best, then send them out to do their thing. Sounds incredible. Um, let's take a look, look at some of the other top voted responses as well while we're here and see if we can pick up on some themes. Uh, again, pay your training workforce or trainers. 
for their time rather than relying on PhD students to volunteer. Again, yeah, paying people the best. Um, tailored one-on-one -on -one training sessions. More people, again, people, <laughs> uh, to support more programs. Uh, we've got a couple of similar ideas. Staff hire at a good salary, permanent positions. Um, so let's talk about it. So we've got some roaming microphones. Uh, I want to talk about people and how we can, uh, how will we get the best people? How will we actually allocate these funds? So we've got the idea. We know what we want to do. We want to get people. How can we go about that? Uh, if you're on Zoom, feel free to post in the Zoom chat. Otherwise, in the room, throw your hand up if you have any ideas of where can we get the rest best people and how can we fund them or how do we spread out the money, our funds <laughs> to make best use of that. Yes, we've got a comment over here. Thank you so much. So, uh, there's something that I would like you to address later, but I will start with the answer. Uh, it's about puppets, and they got two votes, so I just want to know what that was about. Uh, with regards to people, 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 I think I voted for it as well, not mine. Uh, it's the retention of those people. I think that is the paramount importance. You can train them <coughs> as best as you can, if they're not satisfied because they have the skill set, they go anywhere around the world today, not just in Australia. How can you manage that better? Accountability, transparency. Simple as that. That is an excellent comment. So thinking about, yes, we can get the best people if we incentivize them with lots of money. Um, but it, I think it goes beyond just money at that point because you want people to be passionate and feel like they have an impact and that they're doing something that they're excited and want to continue doing. So how can we retain people once we've hooked them in? Did you have a comment over there? Um, there's been mention about sort of PhD volunteers. Um, PhDs are fantastic trainers, but you need to pay them. Um, they are actively doing, a lot of them actively doing really good data science work. They identify with most of our trainees who tend to be young researchers as well. Um, they are learning themselves, they know what it's like to be a learner. They're keen, they love the other opportunity to have a casual job and, and work regularly doing this training. Um, yes, you lose them after a, a couple of years, um, so you do need to have a succession plan, which obviously is difficult if you want to have long-term people, but yeah, if you Absolutely, I recommend PhD students, but do not expect them to volunteer. Pay them properly. And I just saw a comment in the Zoom chat that said, go Mark. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, that is, we agree. <laughs> yes. Uh, would you like to pull out one of the responses and yeah. chat to something? Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, there just seems to be a very um, strong theme here about um, people, investing in people. But yeah, as well, I think investing in people relies more than just paying them well. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit more about retainership. And, um, you know, we can, as Marian said, invest in these people monetarily, but how can we actually get them to stay? So what sort of activities? So we've, we've discussed the what, and we've also discussed, you know, the how, but how do we make sure that they... Um, stick around for the long run. So how do we implement that type of um, change to retain? Yep. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I just sort of want to counter that. I think retention is a, a really good thing, um, and particularly in certain situations. But I also think there's value in people moving from one mm -hmm. place to another and building on their skills as they go, because they may not have the the opportunity within an, a single organisation to do that. So moving around is also really important. So I guess maybe one of the questions is how do you entice them back, mm -hmm. um, you know, once they, they have actually attained some of those skills that are really necessary for, for your particular 
research infrastructure or organisation. So, yeah. Sure. So how would you entice them back? I mean, we've got the money. <laughs> One strategy we've gone with at CSIRO is we've actually developed what we call our talent marketplace. So an internal platform currently, but has the, the ability, I guess, to be an external facing platform as well. Uh, what that does is we have what we call gig creators and gig seekers, and it's a matching platform. So essentially a gig creator creates a role or a position a certain skill or type of uh, person that they're looking for to support their projects, generally less than three months, could be one hour a week, could be three months, the opportunity itself. Um, and then they put that into the platform and it uses AI to essentially match the skills required to the gig seekers. And they'll be notified that there's an opportunity available that matches the skills. And then they can essentially swipe right on that and say, yeah, I'm, I'm keen, let's, sure. let's talk. And then there's a handshake kind of agreement there with the um, gig Seekers Manager and, and the project leads. So, yeah, it's a, it's a great plat pl platform. Sure. And, um, yeah, I've, I've talked to a couple of people today and yesterday about how we could probably look to build that as a, a wider um, platform for the innovation, I guess, industry. Sure, and that would work really well with things like the National Skills Passport that um, has also come out recently as well, the um, implementation of that as well. Like, that would really <laughs> integrate well with that. Yeah, absolutely, and and for reskilling and redeploying, it's it's the perfect tool for that, and for retention as well. So if they're mm. not required here anymore, there's more opportunities available. So Fantastic. yeah, happy to chat to anyone that wants to talk more. Yeah, my question was, what software did you use to do that, and are you sharing <laughs> that as a platform? Happy, happy to share. Uh, one of our CSIRO Kickstarter programs um, spun out a company okay. called Rejig. So shout out to Rejig, that's the platform we chose, but there are a few available. <laughs> Cinder for skills. So we're just looking at the Zoom chat and there are some excellent <laughs> comments. Um, so uh, John Brown said, I reckon the puppets comment was related to the mascots. Great <laughs> ideas. <laughs> um, Anne has a great comment as well. Uh, money, professional development, career paths, and good work environment. Those are a lot of different <laughs> things that combine together will make a beautiful pie <laughs> uh, or great environment, yes. Um, another question, this is from Melissa Burke. Uh, maybe the better question is how do we get the money to support this kind of work? <laughs> so this is all on the premise that we have the money, <laughs> but that's a whole other discussion of how do we actually get that those funds. Uh, I think Liz has a comment to share as well. Thank you. Um, and this is not some, this is a later thought on that. How do we get the money? And maybe if we had unlimited funds already, we should consider putting a large chunk of those funds to making more money, right? Uh, so I was um, amused to see the Vice Chancellor of Digital Skills, right, which is kind of great and kind of terrible all at the same time. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's kind of a status thing, isn't it? So, yeah, good, good food for thought. Yes, we've got yeah, another I comment. From I think I saw about five communities of practice in the yeah. initial, and then I think they've been distributed across the votes, if that makes sense. Yeah, that was another thing that I noticed come up as well, sorry. Yeah, was um, establishing a communities of practice. Um, we don't have a lot of time here. We've got one minute left. So if someone um, wants to speak to establishing a communities of practice, maybe using that funding to do that, um, we can take a comment around that. And 30 seconds. Yes. Um, excellent two days and the third day tomorrow. Looking forward to it. You all are data scientists, I'm assuming. You forgive my assumption. But as a data scientist, make that forum. Find the answers in real time. And I think with that comment, I think we can end this. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for submitting your responses. 
uh, voting and joining the discussion, both online and in person. Uh, we'll pass over now to Catherine, when you're ready, uh, for a final wrap-up for today. Thanks, Nireen and Amani. I think that was really, really good, and we've managed to capture a lot of data there too, so um, great stuff. Um, I could probably begin this wrap-up by sort of giving you some of my thoughts uh, around um, the last couple of days, but you people are here, and I'd actually like to hear from you how you think the day's gone, um, are there any things that you've, you've learnt, um, has the networking been enough, given that we're going to have an hour after, after today's session um, to also continue that networking. Um, just any comments that you might have at all about um, today or even yesterday? If um, I think everyone's... Oh, yep. good. Okay, so I had been removed from the sort of research side of things for two-ish, two and a half years and have come back. So this is kind of the first event that I've been back um, in this kind of forum. And I've noticed there's a shift to, um, and I think it came up in that about the paying people. There's actually, and it's more a shift to valuing the expertise. Mm -hmm. I felt like that wasn't, that was a bit lacking maybe three years ago, four years ago when I was sort of last in the environment that it wasn't just about being paid. People were, if we don't value ourselves, why would we expect anyone else to value the work we do? Um, and that reliance on always volunteering. Volunteering is great. It's always great to help out people, but if you provide something for free, people aren't going to value it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Sean. Anyone else? I think I've probably got more questions and answers from today, so um, I'll have to sort of spend a couple of days or maybe even weeks reflecting on it. Um, I guess because we've only got a short period of time and I don't really want to be the person between you and either going home or having a, a drink and a nibbly and a bit of um, chat with everyone today, today at the end, um, we're going to package up all of the, the slides, the um, recordings and also, also the data that we've collected on the Miro and the Mentees and we'll share that with everyone, you know, as soon as possible after uh, the event. And also we've got a couple of posters around that have the uh, evaluation form and it's really important. I know they're a pain to have to complete. Uh, there's a QR code that you can just do it on your phone if you want to. Um, but it's really important for us to get your feedback because it helps us shape the next event. And so this, this event was actually quite different to our last one last year. And so we're, you know, we're, we're not opposed to trying to change things up and do something different um, each year. We're looking or hoping to align the next Skills Summit with IDW and I I think we had a, oh wait a minute, I can click maybe to the next slide. Um, so we're, we're hoping to align it with IDW 2025, um, th that'll be in Brisbane in October 13th to the 16th. So it's likely that we'll try and do it beforehand as a co-located event and there'll be a whole range of other co-located events um, with IDW. and actually having an international perspective, um, a skills perspective, because we will hopefully have a lot of international people coming in uh, for IDW, so it'd be great to capture those people at a skills, skills event. So just keep that in mind, but certainly provide us with some feedback, um, because we really do appreciate it. Um, Abdullah, that feedback you gave me before, make sure you write it down. <laughs> That'd be great. Um, yes, so do that please and also I now need to do some thank yous. So I'd really love to thank um, the skilled workforce development team, our ARDC little family that we have. Um, most of the team are relatively new to the ARDC. Uh, Alan, who is the newest, yep. uh, is only two weeks in. Um, so this is sort of a bit of a baptism of fire for her. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, look, w I 
this, this event just doesn't run without the team. So um, it's been a great effort, so thank you. And we've still got tomorrow to go, so Liz is still kind of champing at the bit there because we've got the Carpentries Connect tomorrow, which is going to be fantastic. Um, to our presenters, and also, you know, particularly, well, not particularly, but to our presenters from the ARDC Partnered Projects and also our Lightning um, Talk presenters, huge thank you. Um, I think it's been a really good... I, I really sort of think that there... I, I know that I picked up on a lot of challenges and, you know, there's some common ones, but there's also some quite different ones there as well that we can kind of interrogate a little bit further. Um, so from my perspective, it's been really, really valuable. Um, I hope it's been valuable, and James, I'm going to kind of throw you in there. I hope it's been valuable for, for you uh, coming along to something like this, and hopefully you're making connections with people as well, and, um, you know, the, we obviously are going to continue the conversation around skills with you guys and the other projects too. Um, but it's really nice to be able to highlight some of the things that we're doing and some of the, the challenges and barriers that we, we, come, we come up against as we're trying to do this work. And skills is just so critical to... Um, everything that we're doing in this space. Um, and of course, the big, biggest thank you of all goes to the people who came here and you did exactly what I asked you to do, um, contribute, uh, participate in, in everything and, ooh, um, you know, provide us with your input and insights and, and it's always really, really valuable bringing you folk together. Um, so it's it's been fantastic. So... Um, that's pretty much it, unless I've missed something, guys, because I generally do. So, so remember, oh, I have, oh my gosh, I knew I would forget someone, the AV folk. Thank you so much. Could not have pulled it off without you guys, absolutely. So thank you very much. Um, see, this is why you need a team behind you, you know, I was forgetting. Uh, anyway, so that's it. So... Remember to join us tomorrow for Carpentries Connect and we'll have another fantastic day. And if you're not um, staying for Carpentries Connect, lovely to see you all. Um, hopefully I get to talk to you. If you're sticking around tomorrow, I'll have more time to talk to people, which will be really nice. Um, and, yeah, happy journeys whichever way you go, today or tomorrow. So thank you, everyone.